Hey, folks, thanks for downloading and subscribing to This is the LLA Show. That's live life aggressively. Live, keyword here, life aggressively. Now, I think people now have gotten so hung up on the whole LLA part, they're forgetting actually what it stands for, Mike. Oh, and by the way, that's Mike Mall. <laughs> that's Mike Mall on another line. I'm Sincere Hogan. But, yeah, people, I think they're starting to forget just think it's like another TV, like, station like ktla they just like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah right. i'm gonna go listen to lla <laughs> like no th- those letters actually mean something man <laughs> so. yeah and they and they mean a lot to these people because we have some lla vips these people are taking aggressive action to support the show so that the rest of you can listen for free and some of the people that have been supporting us this week include brad atkinson jose salazar brandon holmes Rodrigo Velarde, Jeffrey Foster, Scott Ritchie, Scott Shetler, who's a good friend of ours who's going to be on the show soon. We got Tim Dyer, Matthew Bothwell, Roberto Aperverate, and Octav- Octavio Tavar. So these fine gentlemen have been using that coupon code LLA to get 10% off the best nutrition supplements around and support the show. And we're going to be talking to top strength coach Vince McConnell today about how to train as you get older, how to keep thriving. And one of the things you can do to keep thriving with your training is take Restorezyme. It's the most important supplement to take for those of us that are over 40 and still working out hard. And it's beneficial for anyone because it's an inflammation fighter. But if you want to keep striving and avoiding injuries and have optimal workout recovery, you need to add that to your toolbox today. So use that coupon code LLA. Go over to MikeMahler.com. Go buy three bottles of Restorezyme and start adding that to your routine to take charge of your workouts this year. Yeah. And also head over to NewWarriorTraining.com. Use the same coupon code. Get 10% off all the stuff that's over there. And also want to give a shout-out to all of our VIPs over at Patreon as well who aggressively support our show on a monthly basis. All, like some of these folks have been on for a while since we started doing Patreon over a year ago. So I just want to give them a little recognition right here. David Bronner, excuse me, David Brower. Sorry about that, David. And also okay. Louis Britz, Nicholas Balgobin, Ravindra, Ravindra. That's an interesting name right there. <laughs> Make sure to mess it up. <laughs> and then we got two times the Nelson right here. We got Delard Nelson and Steve Nelson, and also Riley. <laughs> Thank you for supporting us, as well, man. <laughs> yeah, Riley's a great guy. <laughs> yes, sir. And then Rachel, Donna, John Beretta, Herrera, and then Todd Smolin. You know, that's just to name a few of the folks that are already supporting us on a monthly basis through Patreon. And now you can join that same group of fine folks by heading over to patreon.com slash LLA podcast. Become a monthly supporter. And in that little box right there, start off with $5 or even more and support the show on a monthly basis. Keep this thing going and growing, folks. All right. All right. Vince, how you doing today, man? Man, I'm great, Mike. How you doing, Sincere? I'm good, man. First of all, happy yeah. birthday, sir. Yeah, happy so birthday to you. That, that, that was a few months ago. That, yeah, that well, that, well, well, according, <laughs> according to you. Skype, it says your birthday is today. <laughs> that, was la- day. that was it's the last time you got sincere. on Skype. <laughs> so, yeah. Every time you get on Skype, it's your birthday. So this, this must be the first time you've logged in since the last time. Yeah, yeah since I saw, talked to you guys last time. I think I've been on once since then. And uh, yeah. But they didn't wish me happy birthday, so I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to take it out on them next time. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, like Sky. Better late than never, man. So, yeah. But we, we have so many good talking points, oh, and yeah. a lot of it is from that article you wrote on how to train past 50. But really, the information you have in there applies to all age groups, especially those of us who've been working out for a while, because you yeah. have to distinguish the difference between training age and your literal age. Now, you could be 40. And you started working out when you're 38, so your training age is two. Or you could be 40, you started working out when you're 18, so your right. training age is obviously a lot higher. So sometimes someone's going, well, I mean, I'm, I'm only 35. Why am I having these issues? Well, you've been working out hard since you were 16. You've been pushing it hard for almost 20 years. Right. Yeah, and the thing is, is exactly what you just said. When you understand that every workout is accumulative, mm-hmm. meaning that it's having some effect on your body, and in your, your physical chemistry and, and as well as the psychological part as far as experience goes. But we're talking about the physical um, effects, both in a positive and in a negative. I mean, when you're not fully recovered and you go into a workout, your body is going to accumulate stress that you have to deal with in the next workout. And then that progresses over days, weeks, months, years. So just like you said, I mean, for instance, I started training when I was 12. And, and I'm, and you guys are probably already, know I'm 50 now. So just imagine how long I've <laughs> actually been doing. So, and again, that's not, not just talking about pushups. I was actually doing some form of weight training at 12. So, um, I'll be it probably not good, but at least I was doing something that was affecting my body. And that's right. the point. You don't have to be doing things correctly 
for five, 10, 15 years. I mean, just doing any type of training is a stress on your body. And when you're younger, like we talked about as far as how it is a microcosm in life, when you're younger, you can get away with more mistakes. At least the ramifications of those mistakes don't show up until later. And so I've had guys that, you know, I've got a bunch of clients that are in their 40s and not one of them is not dealing with some type of physical impairment. Yeah. And so with that being understood at somewhere down the line, they could look back five years, 10 years, 15 years, because most of them have been doing they've their former athletes have been doing some type of training. They can point back to, yes, I used to do that exercise either in excess or incorrectly. And that's affecting them today, whereas it might not have affected them as much when they were 30, but it's affecting them at 45. Right. You, you know what I wish, Vince, is like, you know, we, we've all experienced this as coaches. There's always that one guy that always comes back, or even some of the females as well, that always talk about, well, I was lifting this and I was doing this when I was in high school. <laughs> but you know yeah. what? I wish they always want to focus on all that good stuff they did back then. But I wish they would really come and say, you know what? I was lifting way too freaking heavy and train and overtraining way too much when I was 18 and when I was 17. I remember in high school where I would sit there and just go heavy every day of the week through the whole year and through the whole off season. And maybe that's why I feel like I do. I wish they would actually reminisce. And think yeah, about they they, that. they leave the part about how their butt was two feet off the bench every time they did, and then they and then they bounced the bar off. Yeah, yeah and they had a fractured sternum, you know, from, from bench pressing. You know, and they talk about that too. You know, but the thing is that when you are doing it incorrectly, unless you have proper instruction, which is very rare at a younger age, at at least, or if if it is there, usually you don't have anybody speak up enough if you're able to get away with what you're doing incorrectly. So the point, or you're not going to listen to it. So Mm -hmm. the point is, is that you're building up a lot of bad stuff, if you will, Mm -hmm. that you're going to end up having to pay the price for later on. And that's something, it's just like when somebody is not responsible at an early age and somebody just pampers them and they never have to deal with that. It's not like they're going to wake up when they're 45 and go, hey, I'm 45. I'm going to be a mature individual now. They're going to bring, they're going to bring that stupidity into 45, into 50, and then probably, you know, to their grave. They're never going to change. Right. And that's why it's important to understand from an earlier, the earlier, the better that you can understand how to do things mechanically correctly. Now, that doesn't mean robotic. Because everybody's going to have a little bit of, of learning process about how to do things correctly. It's not like this. I mean, we've been in this long enough to know no two people are going to perform even a mechanically sound exercise exactly the same. You know, we're not mm-hmm. stick figures. But at the same time, if you understand mechanics from an early age and muscle tension and, and things like that, and that's really what the article is about. It's about something that, hey, when you're older, you're going to really get this. If you can understand this at an earlier age that much more power to everything you're doing. It's not just going to keep you healthier, but you'll make better progress. Most people assume that training in a healthy way means that you're going to have to satisfy, be satisfied with something less than your optimal performance. And that's right. absolute garbage. It's yeah. actually the opposite of that. And I know that um, Sincere sent me a, a message earlier talking about mobility and activation being the foundation of everything that we do from a performance standpoint. And that's why I get into the mobility and activation stuff at an early age, because it literally is the gateway to optimal performance, not just performance, but optimal performance. Cause you can get away without doing things correctly, but optimal performance, you cannot get away with doing things incorrectly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that does a big difference. I like what you said in your article about how most workouts are going to be bridges between the ones you're excited about. And, that, and that's so true because when you hit a PR, that's a that's usually maybe once or twice a year that you're going to hit those things. And I think the misconception a lot of people have is that if they get on the right program, it's just going to be PR celebrations <laughs> where every week you're just hitting some new PR. You just have to find that magic program. And people are constantly scouring the research trying to find this magic program when in reality is it's just coaxing results as you said rather than trying to force things that's going to give you the best results in the long run well it becomes like a drug it comes like a drug it's like you always want that the next high to be better than the last high you don't ever want to come down that's what prs are basically for a lot of folks it's a high you know and the thing is they but the thing is when a high wears off it's back to reality and the reality is all right you've hit that pr 
Now you got to start thinking about the next step. You know, now you got to think like, do I need to keep progressing with this one exercise or this one go, go beyond that? Or do I focus on something else? Or do I need to go back and work on some things that I may have ignored prior to that? So, and most people don't want to deal with that. It's like, no, man, I just want to keep hitting these PRs because I can brag about that. Nobody wants to brag about, all right, so now I got to start a new deadlift program because I didn't, I didn't deadlift this year. I just focused on improving my squat. Nobody wants to brag about that. The only time they want to talk about that squat is like, man, I finally hit like 500 on the squat. They don't want to talk about the process of getting there. Everybody just wants to see the end result and talk about the end result. That's what yeah, happens. That's right. <laughs> yeah, the only place that regular, consistent, frequent PRs occurs is an ad copy. It's not real. It's, it's not real. And, you know, and maybe to a complete novice where, you know, they did two push-ups and then they did three. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, mean, I mean, I understand that. But the thing is, is that you're right about this, Sincere. We do chase that feeling. It's, it's something, and, it's, and, it, and again, like I mentioned in the article, the ego, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. Everybody wants to shoot down the ego and say, well, you can't. Yes, you do have to keep it in check, but the ego is what's going to get you up in the morning. It's going to get you actually training on a right. consistent basis. If you completely shut the ego out, you're, you're probably you're not going to get very far in life. I, mean, I don't think so I don't so. think it's yeah I don't think it's bad to chase that feeling. Right. I just think it's bad to have the expectation that you're going to have that feeling every time you work out. Exactly the addiction to it it goes right yeah. back to that. You so have to realize there's want, there's kind of waves that ebbs and flows of these things. And so what we want to do is and this is applicable to any of the listeners is that we want to keep the lows moderate. We never want to get to where we crash. Right. And I right. think that what happens is we chase those highs. And we want that that PR. We're mm-hmm. not feeling it on a given day, and we go, I don't care. I'm going to put that extra plate on there and get my new PR in the deadlift. <laughs> right. It does not matter. And then guess what? Either something is going to go wrong when you do that. I mean, even if you hit it and you don't get hurt at that stage, there's going to be something you're going to – what it does, it just it forces that need to have to do that again. In other words, it's just like gambling. You're not going to go, okay, that's the last hand I'm playing. It's that, hey, I want it, now I'm going to do it again, and then I'm going to do it again. So what it does, it sets the stage. So when that inner voice is telling you, that sixth sense is telling you, not today, but you go ahead and do it. You go ahead and get under the bar, and you you do it, and you don't get hurt. See, what that does, it sets it up to where you're going to have to do that again, and at some point it's going to bite your ass. Right. And that's and that's the key to understanding it is that it's not about, hey, I got away with going against that inner voice. I'm talking about veteran lifters, guys that know about a little bit about being under the bar. And what happens is you got to look at it and say, okay, as long as I am keeping that prize just a little bit out of my reach, that's the goal. And that, yeah. that's ultimately your goal. And then when you do hit that PR, unless you're competing for a contest, unless you are literally peaking for a show where you know, you know, I've got or a meet and you go, I've got to hit my best on that day. That's a whole different thing we're talking about. Right. And there, and obviously you, you don't want to hit your best the week after the meet. You want to hit it on that day. <laughs> so that's, that's the time that you do set that aside to some degree because you're a competitive athlete. We're talking about guys that are wanting, like you were talking about earlier, Mike, about hitting the new PR and the, yeah. the deadlift. It's about keeping it just out of reach. And when it's there, bam, you hit it and you know you hit it with confidence. And it's something that when you do it that way, yeah. you're able to back off and accept that was, that was my, that was my A plus day. Yeah, you don't yeah, want to get you don't want to get you don't want to get greedy. I think that's what happens. Someone hits a PR exactly. and may, and because they trained properly, the PR felt easier than they thought it would be. So now they're going, "Oh man, I could add another 20 pounds to it." It's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you just lifted more than you ever have before. Leave it alone. Leave a little then bit you, behind." Then, exactly. Then you put your set point so far out and then <laughs> and then what happens is is then the discouragement hits. Then the right. oh crap. Right. Now what? Now what am I going to do because right. you know that was that was 550 and I'm coming in the next week and 475 feels like 875. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, and, and it is, I've seen guys going to, I've well, I mean, the first mistake is to, you're coming back the next week and trying to lift again. You should, that, that, it's time right. to take a week off. You know? right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing is that when you do it in a way where it's a conscious, like, okay, today's the day. Right, then, right. And that's differently than saying, okay, according to my spreadsheet, <laughs> I've got to do this today. Then, you know, <laughs> It's just it's just a, it's a vicious cycle when you do it that way. So what we want to do is to always look at it as, OK, today I'm going to look at it from the standpoint of what's there, what's in the tank and take it to that point and then be confident enough that you're in it for the long haul to be able 
to say, leave it for another day, to be able to look it in the eye and say, okay, hey, it's, it's going to be there, and then be able to back off and be able to sustain that type of, like you said, ebb and flow, because is exactly what it is. We Every day, we want that mountain experience. You want to be up at the top of the peak, but the reality is, what is the peak implying? It, it implies that from there, you got to go down. So what we want, we want to keep it just there, just there to know it's always there, to know it's always there within our reach. And that's, that's where you have longevity and training. And that, that leads to you making wise decisions. Right. And also, I mean, what, what does this PR even look like? Sometimes people chase a PR so desperately that they manage to pull it off, but it looks horrible. <laughs> looks like, I mean, you see it on, you, you see these kind of PRs on YouTubes all the time where someone's back is so rounded that uh, it looks like their their spines about to pop out, <laughs> and or, or their knees look like they're about to crack on a on a heavy squat. So I mean, I don't want to just hit a PR. I want it to look good. I want people yeah. who see it going, man, that looked good, looked smooth, that, fast, consistent. Exactly. And then that's right. with chasing numbers of any type, Mike. That's exactly yeah. what happens because you're focused on the numbers. So the exercise is not even the same. It goes back to like, for instance. You know, the, um, say, escalating density program that Charles Staley put out years ago. You'd see people following that program, and they were trying, and the whole point of that, for those that don't know, is you yeah. have a 15 minute period, and you get as many reps with a certain weight within that 15 minute period. And your goal is to surpass that in the next workout for either that exercise or that muscle group. <laughs> now, what happens is your, your brain is going, I've got to beat, I got 60 three reps last time. I've got to get 64. It doesn't matter how I get them. I'm going <laughs> right. to get 64 or it's a complete failure. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's just, that's the whole point. So you, yeah. so what you're doing, say if you're doing something like a, you know, whether it's a squat and your depth is below parallel for the first workout, then the next workout, cause you have to beat that <laughs> right. number. It's a little bit higher up, a little bit higher up. Little Perfect bit higher example. Up until, yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's ultimately not only quality suffers, but that's also how you're going to end up inviting an injury. I mean, by the time you hit the PR, you're doing a one inch squat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But <laughs> you you're beating your numbers. <laughs> but you're beating your numbers. Hey, man, you I feel great numbers. about yourself. You know? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> you see that all the time. <laughs> but yeah, actually, yesterday I had one of those not today moments. Actually, when I got <laughs> on the squat rack, first of all, I, just, I had to sit there and think about, okay, why does this feel so heavy today? I mean, this is only 5% more than what I did last week. But so many other factors happened this time. Like, okay, it was like, first of all, it's cold as hell, cold and dry as hell in Houston, which is very odd. And, you know, it's something not really used to. So, again, I need to warm up a little bit longer than normal. But I like, and just as I walked up to the rack, I just kind of felt like, okay, you know what? Just not really feeling it like I was when I was driving over to the gym. So, you know, <laughs> you know, when I was driving over, I'm like, yep, all right, 75% this week, got this, man. You know, yeah, three, three those, reps. Those, those drives are sometimes the highlight of the workout. <laughs> sometimes you're driving over, you can't wait, and exactly. then you get in there, you're like, oh, I don't know what's wrong today. <laughs> exactly. But I, like you and I were talking once this year, I go, what, you, you know, during your warm up weights, mm-hmm. whether you should go to yeah. the, to what you had planned, right? Exactly. Like if you're exactly. planning on squatting 365 and then 315 feels heavy, it's not like yeah. it's going to get easier. You know, exactly. More exactly. And that's what I felt. As soon as I raised them off the bar, I was like, oh, oh. I just kindly put the bar right back on the rack, stepped back and looked at it like, mm-mm, and kindly walked over to Jacob's ladder, strapped up, and said, oh, this is what I'm going to do today. I was like, you know, I'm not going I'm not going to squat today, but I'm still going to go ahead and work my, my legs now on Jacob and just kind of get my condition and get warmed up, you know, just kind of loosen up my hips because I felt my hips felt really tight when I got ready to do that squat. I was like, nope, this is not the time to sit there and just do it anyway. If my hips are feeling that tight, no, it's, it's, it's going to lead to some very bad things to continue yeah. to try to squat like that. So, yeah. So, so and guess and guess what? Sincere. What all you did is you, you um, in that given day, you faced a roadblock. Now, did that mean that you just completely scrapped? Your training objective, or oh, did you no. just take a detour? You took a detour. <laughs> See, that's the de- thing. That's yeah, a squat. It's called a squat deferred. A you didn't become a Jacob's ladder, you know, you know, fanatic. I mean, no one just, will ever be a Jacob's ladder fanatic. That's like being a prowler fanatic. That those things or a burpee fanatic. Those things do not exist. <laughs> that, that's my, but that's my point though. Yeah, exactly. Is that you know, on a day like that, yeah. it's not like you went in and you said, okay, well, I've got to completely throw my plan out. If somebody was to follow you and say, wait a minute, you just put that that exercise you were going to do on ice today. What's up with that? I mean, it's not that you changed anything. All you did was you made a wise decision that will allow you to come back to that exercise stronger. I just and suspended my. I, over, yeah. I, I suspended my campaign, like all these candidates are doing right now. <laughs> that's all that was. Yeah, man. So, Vance, what I mean, what are the common mistakes people make as they get older with training? Let's say over 40, 40, 40 to fifty. 
Uh, well, there's so many that, I mean, it's, it's to each person. And again, cause yeah. I train so many people, it wouldn't be like, you know, one or two that would be like, okay, everybody makes these, these mistakes as they get older. Right. I think, I think the most important thing to, let me, let me, let me answer it with this and then it'll, it'll better explain the mistake, <clears throat> the, the, our primary mistake I think people make. It goes back to the have tos, the have to exercises. Right, the people, right. people are not willing to, to make the decision. You know, it's, it's, a, it's something that they, you can either make the decision or it'll be made for you. Right. <laughs> right. That, that you, that you need, you need to change the way that you address, um, the, the workouts that you're doing, not necessarily like, again, you know, it doesn't go to where I'm going to throw the deadlift out of my workout and just get on Jacob's ladder. It's a matter of understanding that to train the deadlift movement, the bar may not be agreeing with you, certainly not from, from the ground, you know, if for whatever reason at a certain stage. And, and it's not like a one day thing that happens that you go, okay, now it's out. I had a bad day. I'm no longer going to do a deadlift. And let's just use the deadlift because I mean, it's easier to take one exercise and you can apply it. You can apply it to any movement pattern, you know, pull up, um, you know, bench press, squat, lunge. I mean, you can just, and every, every movement pattern you can apply. So say deadlift and somebody has deadlifted from the ground with a bar most all their life. And they just over a course of several workouts, they tend to start having either some SI joint issues or just in general, lower back soreness that just never goes away where it's something that's affecting their life on a daily basis. And again, we're not talking about a power lifter here that, that is deadlifting for competition. We're talking about somebody that is deadlifting for the overall health as well as to, you know, improve the way that their body looks and feels. So what we would do in that is first say, look, let's take it a little bit higher off the ground. Let's go into the power rack and let's go from, let's see if that is the issue here. Right. If it's an issue, if that doesn't correct it, then maybe we go with single leg variation, a, a unilateral deadlift, holding two kettlebells. If that doesn't do it, you know, we, we find another pattern. We might have to go to, you know, a hip thrust. I mean, there's different things, and that's, that's rarely the case that you have to completely throw the deadlift out. But you've got to find a variation that agrees with you. And also what I find when that happens, there could be some type of weakness that's just rearing its head at some point where you can come back to that deadlift. Say you've hit a plateau in the deadlift and, you know, say it's, you know, for this person, 405 and they get to 405 and they realize, you know, every time I add those extra fives or tens, for some reason, something just goes wrong. Yeah. And so what you do is you give that, you, you give a vacation of that, that variation. You either go to a rack deadlift or you go to a single leg deadlift. A lot of times, or trap bar deadlift, a lot of times what happens, they'll come back to that at a very modest weight to just relearn the movement pattern, get their technique in order, and they find that they can surpass that 405, whereas if they would have continued to just put their head down and be determined to continue doing the exercise hard-headedly, right. then something bad would happen. So I think that's probably the most common thing that I see with that. Um, the most the obvious answer would be, Lack of training frequency and lack of doing mobility and, and activation drills right. and stability, right. stability drills. Because as we get older, time becomes an issue. And the first thing that goes is the stuff that we assume is not going to change the way that our body looks. <laughs> right. we assume, <laughs> That's right. We assume it's going to be, you know, I got to do the heavy stuff. I've got to do even my cardio. Right. But I don't want to do the mobility. I don't want to do this, you know, any form of you know, dynamic stretching or anything that's going to prepare my body because I just don't yeah, no, have no restoration, no massages and things exactly. like that. I mean, I've exactly. found that, you know, getting a sports mass, I get a, I've been getting a sports massage once a week for over a year now. And I, I have found that it is, it has made a tremendous difference in not only work, the quality of my workouts, but also avoiding injuries because she's fixing whatever problems I created that week. So I'm not allowing them to accumulate and become something big where now you can't work out at all. No, that's the, right there. Restoration. I mean, and that, and again, because you're you're only as good as one of the principles of the eight that I've got in this article, is and it's the, the final one, not because it's the least significant. It's actually the most significant. If you're not recovering, you're not making progress. And recovery is not a sexy word for somebody that's wanting <laughs> that's to right. look to look better and to get stronger. You know, you're thinking, you know, that's not. And there goes that immaturity again. You know, the right. level of, you know, as somebody's level of maturity from a training age goes up. 
that doesn't necessarily mean that their maturity from a psychological standpoint goes up either. I mean, you still have people that are willing to do because they basically go until I can't walk. I'm going to still put a freaking bar on my back. And I'm going to squat the way that I am, you know, the way until until finally they literally can't just do basic daily things. And then they're like, well, well yeah, you have people like that in the bar, too, right? Like, I'm just going to keep drinking until I run this body into the ground. <laughs> I'm going to get toe up to I throw up is what they, yeah. <laughs> so. that, that's kind of a Western concept, too, yeah. right? This, this excess, excess, yeah. excess mindset of. If you're not pushing it 110 percent, and I hate that phrase too, 110 percent. Last time I checked, 100 percent. 100 percent. Yeah. Tell me, anything extra just means that now it's 100 percent. Obviously, before well, you did that, 110. Well, why, why 110? Why, why not give me 120 then? All right, you know, give which me 150 goes, if you're really which goes serious. To prove that really, it's not 110 percent. Just means you were actually going at 90 percent originally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> me, you're going at 10 percent. You mean? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know what common core math you're using, buddy, but uh, no, in the old math. But I no, think but also, it's, Vince, it's that mentality. Anytime you go to the gym no matter how you feel you got to give it 110 percent kind of attitude <laughs> but yeah, and then you have the mind you have the mindset that says but i used to do a b and c back uh, in the day there, i used to do this and, and 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 then you go my answer to that is always that does not mean it was better it means you were better <laughs> able to tolerate it that's all you know, it's like when somebody drinks to excess and goes, I used to be able to knock down two kegs in a, you know, on a and Friday night. And I can and look now, at them and tell, know, I, I like, I can asleep. see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I fall asleep looking at that, that, that kick, that kick, that kick, stayed with you. Ultra, you know, <laughs> and then, you know, and it's like, well, that's the point. I mean, the thing is, it, it's telling you something. I mean, you were yeah, not, yeah. you just tolerated that back then. It wasn't that it was better. It's just that you were able to, Amen. you know, put up with stuff that your body was getting beat up by. So when your belly comes through the door, your beer gut comes through the door before you do, to my, uh, to my, your reputation. We, we no, precedes you, okay. <laughs> but also, you know, we, 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 don't, we don't have, yeah, we don't have to wonder if that's true or not. <laughs> that's I see, man. Yeah, but one thing, Vince, I think another thing is when you tell, when it comes down to, I think the mistake is with the word recovery, that people automatically assume that would do nothing. And so you got one or two people when that happens, when they think that way, do nothing. So I'm like, cool, I'm with that. I don't want to have to work that hard again. I don't have to train that hard again, lift that heavy weight ever again. I'm cool with that. And then I'll just do something else next time when I decide to do something again. Or the ones that sit there and look at it like recovery means not, I, I'm not doing anything. Well, if I'm not doing anything, then I'm going to lose my gains. And, and I'm going to have to start all the way from the beginning because, you know, if I take two or three days off, then I'm going to lose that PR and I'll never reach it again. It's just, it becomes this panic mode of all these things that just, okay, where are you getting that from? Where's the evidence that that will even happen? Well, people are like that, right? They take a week off. They're like, oh, you know, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm shrinking. <laughs> you know? That's what your wife said too, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the other problem people have is that they they look at exercises like old friends. And that's why it's so hard for them to let moves go that are yeah. no longer a fit. They go, man, you know, I, I miss that old friend. I haven't seen him in a long time. <laughs> right. I just had that happen recently with double kettlebell military presses. I went through a period where I couldn't do them for a while, and then I got over an injury, so I was able to put them back in my program, and I started really light. And as I was doing them, I started remembering how much I enjoy doing this move. I was like, man, I love doing this move. And then I worked back up to where I was years ago. Mm -hmm pressing double 88s, et cetera, again. And, and that really reminded me of like, it was like, wow, pressing double 88s is like hanging out with an old friend that I haven't seen in a long time. Right. So I, I can understand how people get attached to these things because you get attached to the way certain things make you feel. Like the way a heavy deadlift makes you feel, it's easy to get attached to that because you're not right. going to get that feeling doing the leg press no. or doing yeah, some and, other and move. There, there is – a mental aspect or a psychological aspect to exercise selection, no doubt about it, and especially the longer mm -hmm. that you're in this. I mean, it's one of those things when, you know, some people just identify with certain exercises, like you're talking about, Mike, <laughs> mm -hmm. press, right. you know, hearing, hearing, you know, pressing, you know, double 88s to some people is like, you know, why would you want to do that? You know, I mean, you know, there are a lot of things that I would love to torture myself with other than that. <laughs> But the thing is, is that it's something that you identify with. So it goes right back to certain. And when I say biases, that's not a bad word in the way that well, it's, I'm it's all about it. the way it makes you feel. Right? Like exactly. I, press, I press double 88s. I'm like, man, I feel strong as shit. This feels awesome. Mm -hmm. They're flying overhead. You know, you feel like you can just break through a wall. Same thing with deadlifts. You, you yeah. pull five plates for a couple of reps. You just feel like you can do anything You know, at that moment. So, it's, so you get addicted to that because not every exercise makes you feel that way. You know? yeah. Certain exercises, you don't feel anything out of it. Like bent over rows, you, know, you don't get yeah. excited. <laughs> you do it. You do it because it's it's important. But I don't get excited about it. You know? <laughs> and, and you know, and then the other, and that segues into another of the mistakes that people make as they get older, is not 
training heavy enough. I think that mm. there's that, that part where you go to completely to the other side I see. and say, because, you know, I tweaked my back when I did this, I'm just going to do high reps. I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm never going to do anything because I only do body every time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and then you go that route. <laughs> And then you swear by, you know, Pilates and stuff for <laughs> yeah, the exactly. rest of your life. But then, see then, you see people going, oh, I used to do lift. I used to lift weights and I didn't I, know what I was doing. Now yeah, I, I heard just do back. body yeah. weight stuff and I feel great. And, and, like, and, oh, it's, and it's making long muscles now. All yeah, I care yeah. about are having long <laughs> muscles. Like like it's, like they're getting inside their fascia and they're just yeah, yeah, exactly. lengthening. So you I'm, know, toning, I'm toning up. I'm toning up. Yeah, what are you talking exactly. about? Exactly. Not building muscle. I want to tone, man. I'm just toning. just toning. You know, and I'm... So, so yeah, they, they send a they send a focus on this injury that happened 20 years ago. They're, they're no different than the guy that's focused on how he was hitting 405, you know, when he was 18. And you're like, man, I used to hit that. And here's this other guy's like, well, I hurt my back back when I was 25, man. And you know, I haven't done squats, man, like 20 years. I, I just can't. It hurts my back. I can't do that. Like, really? From 20, 20 years ago? Really? Well, that guy who says, you know, I, I did this when I was 18. I mean, the obvious thing there is he's trying to get that feeling back of being 18. And he's somehow feeling that, hey, if I do something that I was able to do when I was 18, I'm going to feel like I'm 18 again. You know? Okay, but, but here's like the question I ask him, like, type You ask him this question. I think about the last girl you hit when you were 18. Do you want to do that again? Like, well, at this for age? a lot of guys, it's probably yes, man. Like, you know, look at, he's probably looking at what he has now. He's, he's looking at what he has now and like, fuck yeah. Man. He's like, I haven't had it that good since 18. <laughs> Oh man! Um, now, why do you think so many guys go to the eighteen and over strip clubs, man? It's all guys over fifty in there. So, that is so gross. <laughs> it's it's all about perception. It's all about perception. You know what what do, what I, I think what I, that I can do? What do I think exactly. and imagine that I can? has nothing to do with reality? <laughs> um, but get, getting getting that, that's a good segue into my my eighty eighty eight year old client. <laughs> Um, what he can, he can, he can talk like what you guys are talking about with the best of them. He, um, when I dead, when I dead, when I deadlift Dr. Joe, who I think I've talked about before yeah, on yeah. the show mm -hmm. and we don't use a bar, but we use heavy ass kettlebells. I've got kettlebells that go up to 176 pounds. Now, somebody that's out there going, well, you know, my PR is, you know, 840 in the deadlift is not going to be too impressed with. Yeah. You know, an 88 year old deadlifting a 106 pound kettlebell for reps or, you know, whatever. But the point is, is that for him, that's heavy. When we go heavy with kettlebells, you know, we'll start with the 32 and then climb up. Right. We haven't gotten to the 176 from the ground yet. I use a couple of two by fours just to elevate it a little bit for him at certain times. But the point is, he's still training heavy for him. Mm -hmm. He's not going, I'm 88. I can't do anything heavy. For him and for the reps that we do, it's heavy. And that's what I'm saying. you got to find a way to challenge your body. Your body, just like we say, your body doesn't know numbers. Well, it goes the other way, too. You can't say, hey, man, I hit a real high rep workout today. What would you do? I did six sets of 20 and push-ups with my hands on a bench. I did you know, six sets of 20 push downs. I did six sets of 20 cable curls. I did it. Guess what? I mean, that's still, you're, you're, ba you're getting nowhere. Yeah. You're absolutely getting nowhere. Doing the, fact, that. the fact you can do six sets of 20. Yeah, I know. You know. <laughs> I mean, it probably wasn't. A, you know, <laughs> that's the same high. one that stays on a, an exercise bike or a yeah. treadmill for an hour or two. But the yeah. point <laughs> is, is that it's, it's, you have to look at it beyond the number part. You have to say, okay, right, again, right. what do I need to do? for the goals that I have. Now, if your goals are literally just like we talked about to just complete a work order or to look at some kind of spreadsheet and say, I just want to feel good that I've completed something because it eliminates the guilt of me not doing it. Yeah. We're not talking to you. Okay. You go ahead and, and continue doing what you're doing. It's obviously working for you. And you think that anything I'm saying is a bunch of garbage, but we're talking to somebody that really wants results that looks at it and says, I do not see the day that I will not be training. You know, and I know the two of you guys without following you guys around and knowing, I know there's something you do every day, either recovery wise, you don't wake up and go, you know, my body and my mind are completely away from this today. I don't care if you're on a deserted island, you're going to do something from a regenerative standpoint to make some level of progress, even if it's just progress and recovery. Yeah. And that's, and that's the way that we're, that, that we're the mindset that we're taking here. We're taking this big approach that doesn't mean a passive approach. 
you know, when you're on a, you know, live life aggressively podcast, you can't talk passive anyway. <laughs> but, the, but the thing is, you, you look at it and you say, if I'm making wise decisions that are going to keep my body intact, the best that it can be. And again, there's nothing that's bulletproof. So there's no such thing as like, I know that I'll never get injured doing this and that, but you can put yourself in the best situation from a mechanical standpoint on a daily basis by doing certain things consistently and following certain principles. And when you do that, then you will realize your goals to your best ability and be able to, to live and talk about it, you know, while you're still doing it, not, you know, like sincere said, not back in the day, you're actually able to continue to do the things that you that you've been doing as an early, you know in your earlier years. I, I don't think people should ever talk about back in the day, regardless of context, mm-hmm. because one, it, it prevents you from being in the moment, and two, yeah. that stuff doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. It's dead. It's right. <laughs> All that exists is right now, and that's going to be dead and gone soon. And if you waste mm-hmm. that, then you're going to be looking back on that, going, "Man, I, I, I was so, so busy in my forties thinking about my twenties. <laughs> I, I didn't even take advantage of what I could have done then." Look, back in the day, only equals one thing. Just it's going to be some type of regret attached to it. You <laughs> right. You're going to regret something, man. <laughs> and um, and then you know, speaking of uh, var- uh, variation and variety, you know, everybody mm-hmm. talks about exercise variation, oh, muscle yeah. confusion, and all that <laughs> stuff. That, you know that bullshit that we talk about. It seems like on well, every like, show. like you said, nothing impedes results more than confusion, <laughs> right? And, uh, progress, and, and, and that's exactly. And so the thing is, is that variation and variety are two different things. You look at it from the standpoint of um, on a program. And like we talked about, you hit a, you either hit a detour, you hit a roadblock. Okay. You need variation at that stage. Okay. That's not, that's not variety. That's very, that's a, that's a conscious decision to take a different direction in order to better make it to your, to your goal, to your right. place of right. destination. And variation For, could be a, a difference in, in repetitions and percentages of the weight you're using. It doesn't necessarily have to be another exercise altogether, right? Exactly. It could be it could be doing exactly what Sincere did that day, you know, where you just basically go variation. I'm sitting loose in the saddle variety where, you know, for instance, I'm going to do a set of Jacob's ladder. I'm going to do a set of deadlifts. I'm going to do a set of cap raises. I'm going to do it. Okay, all that's doing is giving you a better view going nowhere. In other words, you just the the scenery improves, the scenery improves, (laughs) but you're still going nowhere. Right. And right. So, so when everybody goes, well, you need exercise variety. And usually the people that say that they have no idea what they're talking about, and they and they want to appear intelligent. So by saying that, <laughs> well, you need well even the whole confusion. phrase, yeah, even the whole phrase, muscle confusion. Why <laughs> does confusing the muscle sound like a positive thing? <laughs> yeah. Why? Why do you think the muscles even care? Like they're actually they've been pondering on your exercise. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Come on, I figured out your deadlifts. Like, no, no, you know, you didn't. I'm doing P90X. Wait, I'm confused. Well, I, well, Plato, play, play, Plato in my spine was thinking that. Yeah. Like, come on. No, like your muscles are sitting around just contemplating all day and keeping a diary and putting together. Plut- Plutarch in my glutes said that. You know? <laughs> well, again. It's ad copy. You know, exactly. going back to ad copy. Well, you know, that, that's the problem too, man. It's usually usually words like that are in in sales copy. They're trying to sell you something. Well, honestly, when you think about muscle confusion, what they're doing, they're really trying to advertise to children. And when I mean that, people with a childlike mind. Because one thing about it, what are children? How how are children? Let's look at Christmas Day. You buy them a toy. They're excited for about ten minutes. Then they're ready to open up and start playing with the next one. So right. what they're doing is very insult. First of all, you should be insulted that anyone is even coming to you talking about, hey, you know, we're going to give you variety. Because you know muscle confusion, they're talking down at you at that moment. They're thinking you're an idiot, or they think that you're very childlike. They're the adult; they know better, and you need to just do this to keep you entertained. Because otherwise, you're gonna throw a fit, and you're gonna ha- just fall out in the middle of the floor and just lose your shit right then and there. So it's very insulting, right there. So they say you're not adult enough to know what a real program is like, and what a true what a program that's really gonna benefit you in the long run is like. You're not there yet. So here, little child, take this, <laughs> you know, for now. So that's what that is. And you should be pissed off that someone's coming to you like that, man. It's insulting. Well, spe- speaking of that, Sincere, what, what is your opinion on what do you think they're going to do with hoverboards next year to make the second generation hey, hoverboard? Hey, let excited? me tell you. I'm going to, you know, I just sat there and watched like those Super Bowl commercials on YouTube a minute ago. And I remember that uh, I just take that one quote from James Harden from the Rockets when he's looking at one of those hoverboards going by. First of all, I look at him just like he did, like, yeah, those things, whatever they're called. Because, you know, because my thing is, I look, look, I saw Back to the Future. Those, these things that these kids are riding around on now, those are not hoverboards. To my, it's like I said, it's a, it's a poor man's segue. That's what it looks like, <laughs> man. So, my thing is, yeah, I honestly. Yeah, to me, a hoverboard, you should be off the ground. Exactly. You know? That's not thing. rolling on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> the ground should not even be involved in when, the process. When, we're, when, when we can fly around in them, I'll be interested. That's what's right? going to be a hoverboard. I don't need to stand on a skateboard. 
skateboard when I can walk down the street. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow, yeah, exactly. So standing on a skateboard, whatever, man. So my opinion, Vince, I don't care. <laughs> because thing is, somebody, all it's doing is giving you another a, another option to be lazy as hell. I'm like, you know what? How about get That's on the last? Real, thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Get on a real skateboard and have to use your actual feet and actually exactly. have to push off. Or roller know? skates, something yeah. where you actually have to put some effort into it. Exactly. So I'm like, you're just sitting there and you just get, you're catching a ride. You know what? They got another thing for that. <laughs> it's called a car. <laughs> you know, somebody, just get a friend to pick you up. <laughs> if you just want to ride for free and do nothing, just get a friend to pick you up in his car. Come on, man. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah, we don't we don't need things that are going to take away activity because the, the, the average person they need to incorporate activity. Yeah, we go have use the stairs that. instead of the elevator. You know, go walk to work instead of drive. People live two minutes from work and they could walk there in twenty minutes oh, if they wanted to. People, people park two minutes from the freaking I mean door, but they rather park right in front of the door when they go to a store. Like, but it's always people in the gym that do that too. People are driving around the parking lot trying to. Get, <laughs> that's the waiting funniest. For, thing. Waiting for a front. See, see, I, but I'll tell you, I do that. I'm guilty of that, and my wife will tell you. But it's a competitive thing for me. See, it's, it's one of those <laughs> things challenge. for me. It is. I'm going to find the closest parking spot, and I like that competitive aspect. I'm waiting, and if I see and somebody you, that you need, looks you need like some new competitions, man. <laughs> exactly. That's what <laughs> got it. Like, Life's getting a little boring. We need to bring you out here. Boy. You need some excitement in your life. You Alabama, man. That's, you know, that's the thing. Well, remember where I am. I'm, I'm, I'm in Southern Alabama. You know? that's, no, um, no, you're right, though. I think a lot of people share your view. They're, that's why they're driving around. It's a competition type thing. They're trying to find that spot. But it's then like that one guy cuts him. The one guy gets in front of him, and he takes the spot. And now you're pissed off, and now you're blowing your horn, and you're parking behind him. Like, okay, this could have been avoided if you just parked. <laughs> In the back. I, know. I, I like parking in the back, too, because it's easier to leave. You're yeah, not stuck exactly. in any traffic. And then also I get to do a farmer's walk from the grocery <laughs> store to my car. <laughs> get a little exercise in that day. Exactly. <laughs> but one, one thing I liked about your article also, Vince, is you said that you need to focus on coaxing results, not forcing results. And I think that's not only extremely applicable to people as they age training, but really anyone in general. But especially as you get older, when you try to force those results, you know, that's when you're going to get injured. And now you can't even pursue what you were trying to do, getting leaner, getting bigger, getting stronger, whatever the goal may be. It's it's about getting, you know, if you're if you're going to pry a can open, you can either use a crowbar or you can use the end of a screwdriver. And in and, and the point, the thing, the reason I say that is that, is that crowbar would be you know, a little bit overkill. But. Walk, 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 in, walk into the gym with a screwdriver as opposed to a crowbar. If you come in with a crowbar mentality, some you're going to bang some stuff up and, and it's not going to be a pretty sight. You can never succeed beyond that day with a crowbar. You may you may rule the gym that day, but it's it's not going to be pretty after that. So so the point of that is that it's more of a mindset though than anything because like friends when you're driving to the gym and you know you go okay like today I know it's going to be either a good day or a bad day or a you know day that I'm feeling better or not. You you look at it and you go, is this workout happening to me, or am I the proactive one here that's going and I'm, I'm going to train? In other words, I'm in command. I'm in control of this workout as opposed to it's something that I'm literally hoping that, you know, something bad doesn't happen. And, so, and the reason I say, I know, I know you guys don't approach it that way, but there's, there is a significant part of the population that literally takes that, that performance, not performance anxiety, is more of a anticipatory mm-hmm. anxiety <laughs> yeah. about about their workout. And, yeah. and when and you work. do that, and when you do that, the, the two things: you're either going to take a very passive approach, or you're going to take that approach of uh, where's the crowbar? You know, I don't care. I've got to because I mean, my ego's on the line, and I'll be damned if I'm going to go in there and feel weak today. Yeah, you want to you want to quiet the doubt in your mind. You're like, screw it, screw you, mind. I'm going to go for this no matter what. There you go. <laughs> There you go. And that and that's the thing. And that's when you have to step back. And when I say step back, you just you, you make it before you walk into the gym. You go, I'm committed to this. You gotta remind yourself this. And again, I'm not trying to play mind games here and get too, you know, soft in this. We're just looking at it from a real standpoint for real solutions. And you and you remind yourself, look, I'm not gonna let today's workout determine whether I'm gonna come back <laughs> for my next workout. You know, in other words, you know, if I if I suck today. It's not going to, I'm not going to just say, okay, I'm going to go play golf, you know, next week. It's, it's literally a go in, understand the objective of you walking into the gym that day. And then you may have to take a step one side or the other or a step back, just like we talked about earlier. That's 
coaxing gains as opposed to forcing it. The first time I ever heard that term used was with your friend Clarence Bass that yeah. you guys have had on the show before. Yeah. And that was back in the early 80s when he and I, he was helping me with my training at the time, designing my programs. And I, it was a very, I mean, you guys know the way that his programs are designed. They were very specific as far as, you know, very, very moderate, almost like a Mike, Mike Mincer type at right. the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Didn't leave, didn't leave a whole lot of wiggle room because the, the amount of sets were very minimal. It was almost a minimal base program, meaning that you didn't have a lot of opportunities to hit the target. You, you went in, you hit a couple of sets for this, one set for this, two sets for that. But at the time, that was perfect for me because my mindset was more is better, more is better, more is better, <laughs> right. more is better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he was able to to reel, get me to reel the reins in and look at it from a different way. But then he also said, look, you're not going to bang your head against the wall for that one set. You're going to coax your gains along. And see, and at that time, it made no sense to me whatsoever. I'm like, look, yeah. I've got one set of that exercise. How am I going to? Coax. What does coaxing mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, it, co- coaxing sounds like something you drink. You know, I don't know. I don't know anything about. <laughs> I don't know anything about that word. He had to explain to me that yeah. it just means that you just you go in and you and then and he was dead on. I mean, I look back and that was you know again. You see how long ago that was, and and it was it made a lot of sense to me as the years went on yeah. that it wasn't about. And again, I'm more geared towards more. I mean, that's my my mindset is you know all or nothing. I'm going to be all or nothing. I'm going to add to this. I'm going to add to that. So I get that mindset. Yeah. So I have to literally, you know, bring myself back to balance on the side of being more, you know, take what you need. Don't not any more than that. Do what you need to do in that workout. The coaxing part of it is my you're only as good as your next workout. So Mm -hmm. I check my ego at the door every day with that and say, look, even if I just completely crush it today if it crushes me and i can't train tomorrow i'm not happy yeah you know so and so that's that's the thing is that i'm not just living for today and yesterday i really do see my myself i mean training for me is as much about the process as it is about the accomplishment and Mm -hmm. that and again that sounds corny to some people but at some point you'll understand if you don't understand what that means it, it'll eventually come to you where you'll realize because I've seen too many guys. We talk about, you know, those guys that live in yesterday and I get them all the time when they when they find out who they've heard my name and I meet them around here or, you know, you know, if I'm traveling and they, hey, yeah, hey, man, I used to, you know, all this kind of stuff. And they find out I work with football players and they all, you know, usually football, former football players. They want to talk to me about their training, about what the guys I have the guys doing and everything. Oh, well, back we used to do this and all that. And they and they literally have no ability to reach into their back pocket to grab their wallet. They, they can't because they have no ability to go into external rotation. They can't raise their arm up right. over their head. They can't get out of a chair without assistance. And these are guys in their 40s and 50s, yeah. certainly in their 60s. And, and, I just, and that's when I look at it and I just go, you know, is, is that – and it's not just because of football. When somebody goes, well, it's because of the collisions. No, they'll tell you that the stuff that they did definitely mm-hmm. contributed to it. And these are powerlifting friends too, guys that, yeah. that did compete in powerlifting and stuff. And they look back and they go, if I could have done it differently, I would have done this. I would have done that. So, yeah, let me tell yeah. you, that, those, those guys are scary now for me, you know, being a firearms instructor, because these are the guys that can like they'll conceal carry, but they carry, you know, in the back. So you got to reach around and you see some of these guys struggling. These guys have these big guts and, you know, they used to be athletic. Let them tell it. But I'm looking at them trying to reach when we're doing some of these drills. and They're trying to reach back and get their gun out and they're not making it sound like you're dead. That to my look, man, the criminal already got you. Just just forget it. Just throw your hands up and surrender. Like, man. Hold on a second. <laughs> okay, Give me a minute it. to get my gun, man. Okay, I just make this a fair fight. Well, these are also the guys that can't even get down on one knee to, to do drills, such as like getting low and changing your focal point and and going from there. I'm seeing them just kind of barely squat. I'm like, come on, man. You're not going to always stand in front of a paper target. You know, life is real. It's not 2D where you're going to have to do that. You have to actually move, get off the X and move around. And some of these guys struggle with it, man. It's, it's kind of, it's disheartening coming from this point in my life, from strength and condition and looking at how, and knowing how, how important mobility is to so some of these guys who have no idea about any of this and not even realizing how important fitness is, even when you're in that arena, even in firearms and self protection and you, Thinking like, okay, look, it's it's not about the tool, man. It's actually about the it's, it's you. You know, you're the one that's going to control that. 
You're the ones going to control the gun. You're the one to control the movement and the situation and also have the mental clarity to know, make the right decisions at the right time. This is no different than what you have to do in the gym. No matter what the exercise is, it really comes down to you. And like we said, and those biases and what works for you and what do you use, whether it's a kettlebell, a barbell, whatever else. But at the end of the day, it comes down to you and how are you going to use those tools? Those are inanimate objects. And so the real thing you need to focus on is you. And one last thing is also the one word I think that also gets like overlooked here and it's always mistaken as a soft word. I think a lot with a lot of the folks that we deal with is the word efficiency. And so for some reason, I guess because it's, it's, it just rolls off the tongue so smoothly, can't be this intense thing. But the thing is, when you go in the gym, man, and you're you're going for efficiency, not just spending a lot of time doing a bunch of nothing or doing all these things that are just going to end up wrecking you instead of actually just focusing on the one thing and making that one thing great and trying to smooth it out as, as best as possible. So making that deadlift as efficient as possible. Because one thing about like a deadlift or a squat, you know, one thing about all this extra movement, it just it deters everything. It just makes it a lot harder and also opens up the doors for injuries. So the thing is you want to find out how to make these things as efficient as, efficient as possible. And therefore, you also make your time efficient. You're not spending all day in the gym. You're not the person that trains for two hours in the gym, which I never understand. How? How? Who trains for two hours straight in a gym? How can it be even possible? Like Mike and you're I not, you're not doing you're not doing it well. I mean, it's possible, oh, no. but it's not going to be a good workout no. because you can even <laughs> last that long. You know, what are you doing in there? Like the other day I saw – some young guys doing bench press, and then they did incline press, and then they did decline press, and then they did, and then they did flies, and then they did some machine chest work as well. Well, that, and, that was page seventy-six. And, all, and, and, and they were still in there by the time I finished a full body workout of squats, right? Some kind of press, pull-ups, d- double kettlebell mm-hmm. swings, you name it. You know, full body, very efficient workout that's going to have more impact on improving my strength and physique than focusing on one area for an hour. Well, I can almost bet that that probably came from page 76 of this month's Muslim Fitness, and that's what those guys are oh, doing. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Long, well, well, that's also the mentality it, people have is that they, <laughs> like, the more they do, the more results they're going to get. That's the right. other thing. They're going, well, man, if, if I come in here and do three sets, I'm going to get this. If I come in and do 30, I'm going to get 10 <laughs> times more results. Yeah, and you also get the immediate gratification of having absolutely destroyed a certain area of your body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I got the pump, man. And, the and pump. So, yeah, and that's, and that's the thing is that you know the best results that it doesn't matter if it's – you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody in their 40s or somebody in their 20s, the mm-hmm. best results, even when I'm working with athletes that are, you know, say in the off season and we're just working body composition more than, you know, just performance. And we always do some explosive stuff and all that. But I mean, just the, the, the basic foundational stuff that we do, I like to implement circuits. And, and when I yeah. say circuits, that's not implying <laughs> not the circus. cardio circuit, you know, where you run from <laughs> one thing to the next, right. but a, a combination of exercises that don't compete with each other. Yeah. And, and okay. what I mean by that is you're not going to, you're not going to have a drop off on, you know, like for instance, I don't like to, you know, com- combine deadlifts and pull ups, you know, back to back for obvious reasons, Agreed. Because of, yeah. you know, grip strength. And, but yet if you do that, you're not going to get that localized pump, you know, in the initial stages, but you'll find that the quality, and it goes back to the efficiency, mm. the, ken- the kinesthetic efficiency that I call it, improves when you put, say, four exercises, four basic exercises back to back to back to back in a circuit where you're taking enough rest to manage the fatigue. You're not running through it, and you're keeping your, you're keeping your weights consistent all the way through. So it's not a, you know, hey, I've got to drop the weight down because I'm trying to hurry up and get the circuit in. And you do it that way. And I think um, Chad Waterbury was probably one of the first guys that I read some stuff on where he was doing that with, with um, either in his writings just or, you know, with clients that he was training. And, and I was like, you know, that makes sense to me that because I've, I've used that probably when I was in my best condition and my numbers actually were <laughs> relatively, you know, high as far as the poundages I was able to use when I did it that way. Like one of my favorite things to do right now is a deadlift and a dumbbell flat bench um, bench press. Right. Now, now right. why would you – now, now that, that makes no sense. I mean, why would you – how's the – you know, where's the pump? Where are you going <laughs> – for, for whatever reason, those two, you know, those two are very compatible for me. So when I'm alternating those two back and forth, I find that my numbers go up as opposed to if I did nothing but deadlift rest, deadlift rest, or bench press rest, bench press rest, or even bench press row or something like that. Yeah, you want to keep your energy up. I like it. I do that with squats. I do heavy barbell squats in between each set. I'm doing weighted pull-ups as opposed to just sitting around for three minutes. 
You know, so you're you're keeping your your intensity up, and, and then you're like you said, they're they're yeah, they're non competing exercises as well. So right. you know, if I do a heavy that's, weighted that's, that's pull up, that's not going to hurt my squat, and me doing a heavy squat is not going to hurt my heavy pull up either. So yeah. I like what you said about deadlifts and pull ups. So that that combination, of course, doesn't work for obvious reasons. The last thing you want to do is wear out your grip at all, or any right. of your pulling muscles in between sets of deadlifts. So there are things there there are ways to not combine exercises but you know for no the doubt. most part it's one of those things where if you know enough you know about just how the body works you can design a program where you're able to put things at least in pairs or maybe a tricep or something right. like that and be able to and you'll find that your strength increases and you're talking about watching you know that those that group of guys training if they would understand that from an earlier age but see the thing is it, it goes right back to you don't get the immediate gratification from that because and where i was going to go with it is that you you maybe if the first day that I put someone in a program like that they're not going to go man what a killer pump. <laughs> eventually though, eventually because the quality increases, they will find that they're able to feel you know use that word in quotes if you will they're able to feel the muscles that we are addressing better than if they were combining say you know dumbbell bench press with cable crossover or something like that where they're just completely frying the, the anterior part of their torso and their shoulders, which I think leads to dysfunction at some stage. Not, not that we'd never do that, but I think that if you think that you've got to do that in order to build that area, I think that's where the problem comes from. It comes into that becomes a rule as opposed to just something that you use, you know, on a you know, semi-regular basis, but you'll find that you yeah. get more out of the deadlift and the deadlift, you're feeling it more where you should, which is more in your, in your hips and your glutes than your lower back. And you're able to, with the, the, um, combined with a um, horizontal press, you're able to get better retraction of your scapular muscles. So mm. it puts you in better position for your deadlift. I mean, it's just making decisions like that. As you get older, you'll find that, wow, my performance is going up and I'm able to keep my strength up higher and my body composition is positively impacted as well. And you keep, I mean, there'll be times, guys, that that'll be my workout yeah. you know, for that particular day. I'll just you get, you get more done in less time. So yeah. that's what you're, you're being, you're getting in and out much faster than if you just did one exercise, then you move on to the next one, then you move on to the next one and so forth. Yeah, as opposed to somebody looking at that and going, that's it? That's all you did? I mean, what, what is that? You know, that's there's two exercises. I mean, how's that? That might have been at that stage. It might have been on that day, the time that I that I had because of, you know, schedule demands or whatever. And and a lot of times what I do with my workout, and I, and I recommend anybody that can do this, you know, and if you – if you're in the gym all day like I am, I mean, it's it's easier maybe, but at the same time, it has its own, you know, limitations too because I've, everybody needs my attention. It's not like I'm just – here, you know, and training all day, you you literally, you're focused on everybody else the majority of the time. So I have to set aside 30 minutes to get part of my workout in. And when I say part of it, it's a 30 minute workout. And then I'll come back later and I'll, and I'll basically hit it two times a day, but it's not two hour long workouts. Right. It's, it's what I do is I look at the volume that I'm doing on that day. And, and on certain days, like if I'm, I'm you know, I have an appointment and I've got to just have one session that day, I'll obviously combine the two to that, you know, so that I get all of it in. But the point is, is that if I'm able to spread it out, I find that not only my strength gains go up, I recover better that way. And I, and I haven't had it tested, but I know it's got to have some positive impact on my hormonal integrity as well, just because of the way that I'm not exhausted, you know, as I, you know, I tend to sleep better and everything. And I just have overall energy better when I'm able to split up the amount of volume and I don't yeah. leave a workout totally wiped out. So as you get older, if you're able to do that, if you're able to hit a workout in the morning, say, and then one at lunch or in the morning and then one in the evening, I think that's a wise way to go. And and it goes back to the mobility stuff. Okay, wow, what if you're adding mobility to each one of those workouts? Then you're really – I do my mobility first thing in the morning, you know, where I do a dedicated mobility program. And that, and that to me, is the most important time of the day because it's going to set the stage for yeah. what happens later. That's and right. it also lets me know, you know, how I've slept. It also lets me know, is it going to be a day that, you know, we need to make adjustments in the, in the um, you know, in my workouts or not, or just in general? Do I need to just have a day of nothing but mobility? A lot of times yeah. I'll do that. A lot of times I'll come back later in the midday. And I'll do another 20 minutes of mobility, and then I'll do mobility again later. And it's not because I'm obsessive about it. It's just literally knowing that my body's going to positively respond. Yeah. So it's not... I have to do, I have to do this. I have to, oh gosh, where is somebody took my lacrosse ball? I can't roll my glutes out today. You know, what am, <laughs> you know it's, it's not I mean, it's, a, it's a good assessment tool. Sometimes you do your mobility work and you're, and you're tired just doing that. You're like, yeah. man, 
I'm tired just doing this. Yeah. So and, maybe and, I, maybe and I should. Uh, so I'm going to skip that workout today and do it tomorrow instead. As opposed to if you didn't do that mobility, maybe you wouldn't realize that mm-hmm. until you get to the gym and you're doing your warm up sets and you realize why did I even come in today? This is not going to turn that's, out that's, well. That's Mike. That's dead on. It's an assessment. It's a it's a great assessment that you can use that allows you to make wise deci- decisions for your workout going forward. Because if you come in cold and you haven't done anything but just wake up. Drink coffee, drive to work, <laughs> sit at a desk or whatever you do, and then you go and work out. There's nothing you have to go on other than I'm tired or I'm not tired. Um, or, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 you know, wiped out stress wise because of this or that. I mean, you have no idea. You have no connection to your body at that stage at all. And the thing is, the reality is you go everywhere with your body. There's no such well, thing. Well, it's like I mean, that old saying, you know, preparing for success is more important than, you know, just pursuing success. It's that preparation. <laughs> So a lot of people are just so focused on what they're trying to achieve, but they're not focused on the preparation to achieve that. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly. And that has to do with a daily thing with your with your workouts. And again, the daily part of it is you should do some type of movement on a, on a dedicated movement on a daily basis, not just on days that you know you have to train just on a regular basis. And that gives you a better understanding of what you need to do going forward with your workouts. Yeah. Another thing that I do is, as guys get older and I do this on my own workout, when I know that I want to say increase, you know, I'm, I'm training for hypertrophy and, and I'm, you know, going, okay, well, my, I know that I'm not going to get that solely on heavy deadlifts or heavy squats. Mm-hmm. So I, well, what I do is I don't throw the heavy stuff out. I keep that in, but I'll combine it. Say one of the things I love to do is a deadlift combined with, say, a, um, a hip thrust or a kettlebell swing. Now, that's two exercises, same body part. But what I do is I keep the deadlift no more than three reps, and I'm not going at my max. I'm going, I'm you know, basically, I'm not my three RM. I'm, I'm keeping the weights heavy and manageable, where maybe I'm, you know, I have six in the tank and I stop at three. But the thing is, I keep something heavy in there, even on those times where I don't feel like deadlifting. I'm doing something that's keeping that ball rolling. And that goes back to, again, the coaxing the gains along. And, you know, if I'm not going to do heavy barbell squat, which I rarely do ever do anymore anyway, I do a, a heavy single leg um, squat. I do, you know, heavy, um, you know, front squat, something, you know, especially with kettlebells, things like that. There are ways to make sure you're still getting the job done, but without completely going, okay, I, I can't train heavy anymore. You've got to find ways to be able to, because it's cause and effect. It comes right. Your body does not care what your intention is. And it's, it's like, it's, it's not sitting there going, Hey, we know you mean well. So we're going to give you the result that you want because you've just been such a dedicated, you know, person to your workouts. It's cause and effect. I mean, it comes down to that. You've got to find a way to get what your objective is done. And unless you're a competitive lifter that is targeting certain exercises. And again, those are there. That's in a whole different category. You have to sometimes be able to pull it back. Like, for instance, I've got a um, leg press machine in my facility that is actually called a hip press. It was originally made by Pendulum, and I think um, Rogers Athletic or somebody like that makes it now. It's a hip dominant. It's one of the only ones I've been on. It's a hip. It's kind of like hammer strength, but better. It's a hip dom. No, nothing against hammer strength if they're listening. Um, it's a hip dominant um Leg press, meaning that it feels like a deadlift. And actually, the guy that designed it was a competitive lifter, and he was having trouble getting out of the hole in his deadlifts. And he was being, you know, every time he went to a meet, they said, you really got to work on, you know, maybe do deficit deadlift, something. Well, he designed this machine. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen it before, but um, it it allows you to get really deep into the squat, but without a compensation in your lower back, which is awesome. And I use it with athletes. Now, when I combine this with my deadlifts, I find that not only am I allowing my body to recover a little bit from hammering it with deadlifts, when I come back to the deadlift, I'm stronger. Now, is that just me? Yeah, somebody can make the argument. But the thing is, I'm making an adjustment to get the volume in, but without beating my back up. So it's things like that that you have to do that maybe are, again, you got to know the box to get outside the box, that I'm able to make those decisions. Not that are, They don't throw my, my plan out. All they're doing is I'm still, if I'm going west, I'm still going west. But what I might have to do is I might have to go a little north you know, of where I wanted to go. I might not be able to stay on I-10 the whole time. I might need to go a little bit north and then take a, a slight detour, but I'm still going in the direction 
of where my intention, my intended direction, that's still my mission is still to go west. I'm not going, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go to Canada. You know, who cares? You know, I, I want to go west. But who, I'm just going to have to, I, my body's just not designed to go out west. See, that's what, that's where the mistake is. So with, with somebody out there listening going, yeah, but my body's this and my body's that. I've yet to find anybody that I can't find some way to help them understand a way to go in the direction that they want to go in, whether it's north, south, east, and west, figure of speech, that that they can find that it can either combine certain exercises or choose different exercises altogether that allows them to be able to realize their goals. You know, as long as you understand the basic movement patterns, upper body push, pull, vertical pull, vertical press, you know, hip dominant, knee dominant, core stability, you know, anti-rotation, whatever, all that stuff. Yeah. It's just a, a bunch of, bunch of, you know, gibberish if you don't get why we call it that. And when you do, and I used to not call it, we didn't call it that. We called it bench press and all that. But since, you know, guys like Dan John have come in, I mean, they start calling it things where we go, yeah, that's exactly, that's easier to say hip hinge. Than well, it gives, you, it gives you blanks to fill in, right? So it's so upper body press. Pick yeah, something. Lower exactly. Body, lower body press. Pick something. Upper body pull. Pick something. So as long as you're covering those categories, you're good to go. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing. And when you do that, then you have, you know, you're never going to be 100 percent balanced, but you at least are making decisions that are putting you in the best balance that you can that you can be in. And I still think that as a two to one from for upper body, you need to focus more on the posterior than the anterior, because yeah. I see too many train wrecks of people with their posture, and I, over and over again, athletes are not. And so, you know, everything that we do, even if it's just, okay, we're doing a row, we're doing a press, and we're doing a pull apart, you know, with a band. You know, something just where we're adding a little bit extra volume, or I may have homework for them to do where they do, you know, 100 pull aparts every day. I mean, just it right. depends on the person, but there are things that you can do that help create that balance that, once again, gets somebody coaxing their gains along as they as they go along. It's always feeling like they're getting right at the verge, and then something happens where they have to either quit or completely change, you know, what they're doing, you know, completely change their, their goals or their objectives. So you want to get right on the verge of, you know, grabbing the carrot. And then, unless, like I said, if you're in a meet, yes, go, go ahead and do whatever well, you well, got to do. One thing's for sure. As you get older, you can't, you can't get away with those long gaps between training, meaning that when you're younger, maybe you take a month off because you're on summer vacation. You come back, you're a little bit weaker. You get back in the groove in a couple of weeks. If you're, if I took a month off now from training completely, I don't even want to think about what it would be like when you when you resume training again. No, that's exactly, and that and that's the thing is that when you do, you know, like when somebody and on that talk, when somebody does go on vacation or they, you know, business calls them away for any extended period of time, I always tell people, don't try to make progress on your vacation. What you're doing is you're keeping the ball rolling. That's all, that's all you need to do. That's all you need to do so that when you get back, it takes you one day of getting reacclimated. Yeah, and, and a week a or two is no big deal, right? You go on a two-week vacation. You just stay relatively active. No big thing. But a month, let's say you go a month where you're just not doing any kind of serious physical training for whatever reason, that you're just resting the whole time. At least me speaking personally, especially on certain moves such as pressing, it's going to drop so fast it's going to be frightening. And I think yeah. that's where a lot of people get discouraged is for that they, they go through these periods where they don't train for a while and then they try to resume and they're in such a deficit from where they were before they go, man, this is demoralizing. Yeah. You know, and it goes back to the you know to the saying, don't allow the route to become the path. And, mm. and, and what I mean by that is okay, you, you map out a plan, you know, again, you know, use so whatever say if I'm you know, where I am in Alabama and I decide I want to go to, you know, Washington State. Okay, I get out a map and I look at it and I go, okay. I see exactly where I need to go. Now I'm gonna, you know, either if I'm driving with a long distance, I'm gonna, I'm gonna know exactly what I have to do to get there because I'm down here and that's in the northwest. Now the route I map out is there. Okay. Now what happens if, for whatever reason, you know, I, I hit a city and I go, okay, well, hey, I'm gonna go, you know, a little bit further north or you know, maybe a road's closed. I mean, any number of things that that can possibly happen that would require you to make a slight change. Now, that's not going to change my path. My path is still to go northwest, even if I'm changing my route a little bit. Or if I find that maybe there's a more efficient way of if I've never been before, and I look at it, and I go, hey, the map, I first, when I first looked at the map, 
I thought this was the best way. Well, no, I don't want to go through that major that major artery. Maybe I want to go more this way, and then or or maybe somebody told me it was better. You know, I got I got input that said, hey, it's better to go. My point to this is that it doesn't change the path. Right. All it's doing is changing your route, and you don't want to get identified with no, I got to do it this way or else. And that's where programs will fail you is when you allow them to start calling the shots as opposed to you literally going, hey, this is great. It's allowing me to see what I need to do to be able to make decisions of variation when they come as yeah. opposed to, you know, and then again, it's not the, well, then the whole trip is nothing but a bunch of variations. You know, well, then you're <laughs> right. a mess that way. You're a mess that way, too. So what you do is you allow the numbers and it goes back to what Sincere brought up earlier about let the numbers guide you just don't let them be your master so you know they serve you well but at saying then i do think and um i think i have a quote up on that article that rules are important but what you do is you allow those rules to to help guide you to a place where you don't need to adhere to them now that means you know in other words principles principles are the key right rules will never surpass principles so once you have the principles in place, you don't need the rules, but there's a certain period of needing to follow the rules so that you can understand what to do outside of those. And that's where a lot of people also, you know, they don't stick with anything long enough to even know how to make decisions or no, I should say know when to make the decision. They don't know. They go, hey, is it time? <laughs> uh, is, it, is, is it time to change things up? And we, we, like, we can know. apply that to a lot of contexts, mm-hmm. right? Whether it's business or, or, or any new endeavor, you don't, you're not sticking it out long enough to determine. Yeah, you got exactly. You, you don't have to make wisdom. changes. Yeah, you don't have the wisdom to even make a decision on mm-hmm. what you need to do to to make it more efficient because you haven't. It hasn't become inefficient yet. In other words, what you're doing is working. You know, until it doesn't. So what you have to, you know, make sure you do is to follow that to get it, you know, get a program and stay on it for a while. Stay on the program and then you can start understanding how to make decisions, when to make decisions that'll better improve that path that you're on. Again, it's not changing the path. It's not like, oh, I'm on a powerlifting program for a week. Then I'm going to do, you know, P90X. I'm going to do CrossFit. Then I'm going to, you know, I see that. I see that a lot. Oh yeah, I see. Too. I see that a lot. You know, fortunately, not clients of mine, but I do see it a lot. But actually, more in women. People, people do that do. with diets too, right? They they try mm-hmm. one diet and then or nutrition plan, whatever you want to call it, and then they read another book and oh, well, this sounds pretty good. This mm-hmm. author sounds like he knows what he's talking about. Let me switch over to this. And, and, then, and then, then right when the changes. one that yeah, and then right when the one Mike that they were on starts to kick in, then they're on the other one, and then you go, well, is it because you're on the other one first that led in yeah, to? Right. Because everything takes time as far no, that's, as that's exactly getting, right. Yeah, you know, and, they, and they're like, "Hey, I felt so much better when I was like, I'm like, yeah." I mean, it, it, sure. I mean, the point is, is it, it just comes down to you being. Well, I, I tried it. Or, or, or like, I tried it for a week. It didn't work out. <laughs> you know, it's like unless it's a really bad plan, a week is not long enough to determine. Yeah, it's, it, it's like, yeah, yeah, if you're fasting for a week and you said that didn't work out, okay, I get it. <laughs> you know, but if it's a if it's a sound nutrition plan, you got to give it more than a week. To determine one way or the other, or somebody's on a new plan and they they say, "Well, I was on it and I gained three pounds." Okay, well, <laughs> and I get that, especially especially with women, not just women. I mean, they're guys that, that right. say the same thing, but it, it just it, it gets to where they want that immediate that immediate effect. And I think a lot of that is because we go back to the ad copy thing. Everybody thinks that it's just a miracle that just happens real quick. Anything that you get real quick, you're going to lose real quick, right. you know, or or it's mm-hmm. likely to leave real quick when you mm-hmm. stick something out. And you've actually, you know, been able to you know dig your heels in. Then it's you. It's, it stays with you longer. That, like that's the other thing I like too. Is like the longer it takes to achieve a goal, the, the longer you're going to hold on to it. Though if you if you put a hundred pounds in your deadlift in a couple of weeks, you, 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 you're going to lose that real fast. But if you put it on over a couple of years, your body is acclimated. You're 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 you have adapted to that stimulus now, so you can hold on to it much longer. Yeah, a good example exercise wise would be so for instance, and you know, you know, when you're doing loaded pull ups, it takes a while to develop that type of strength. You have oh, to yeah. work oh, right yeah. on the edge. You can't go to failure very frequently. I mean it's you tough. really have to really have to kind of peel it back. <laughs> and <laughs> you know, and so and so say if somebody works up to, you know, a, a fifty three pound kettlebell, you know, twenty four kilogram kettlebell and they're doing five sets of five. You know, which which is which is impressive, you know, for most people. You oh, know, yeah, it's very good. five sets of five 
And, yeah, and then you have good. somebody that goes, and you have somebody that goes, no, well, I'm going to do kipping pull-ups, and I'm going <laughs> to knock out as many as I can. Yeah. The thing is, you may be able to get 30, but you know where you ain't going to get 31. You know, and not, not anytime soon. It, it's just it, there's no, there's no, you're not, you don't own it. You right. don't own it enough to where when you do it over a course of time and you work up to that five sets of five with 24 kilograms, you know, plus your body weight, you own that. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to instantly jump up to a 28K or something like that, but it means that that's on the horizon. That's oh, something yeah. that, that's right up there that you work yeah, back there, up there's a big, there's a big difference between five sets of five and one set of five, right? Like you can do it one all-out set of five. That's correct. Cool. You could do five sets of five, like you said. You own it. You, you've you've mastered that weight for that rep range, right? And that's when and, and the exercises like that, like with the deadlift, that's what I, I recommend. That it that, that's the coaxing again. Mm. You know, it takes a while to build up to that five sets of five, but that's different than you know knocking down six Red Bulls and then you know. Uh, that's a good way to look at it. Like you do five oh five once <laughs> you know. in the deadlift, and then you work up to five sets of one. You know, that's a right. lot different than just one all out rep of one. Exactly. You can do you can do five singles with it. You you can definitely move up to a heavier weight. You know, and that and like you said, then you have that strength that, that actually you can call that. Hey, that's mine. You know, I own right. that. That's right. something. That's a foundation that you can build off of from there. Um, the, the other thing that um, earlier when I'm and I'm switching back to the mobility part when when we're training for mobility and um, there's a very good quote that um, that sincere sent me earlier. About, you know, the foundation of, you know, basically everything you do is going to come from, you know, mobility. I mean, that's got, you know, the a pyramid is biggest at the bottom, you know, for a reason. And whenever you're training for mobility, one thing that you, and it goes back to the don't force it, you know, you have to allow mobility work. And we talk a lot about mobility. Every time I'm on, we talk about mobility and activation. And, and, and I think sometimes it can get out of hand, you know, where people are just like, oh, it's just like this new religion, you know, of, oh, mobility oh and activation gosh, and stuff like yeah. that. Uh, you know, and you guys have studied Scott Sonnen and stuff and, um, of course, Steve Maxwell, you know, like I have over the years. And Scott has been a longtime friend of mine and, you know, was doing his stuff back before it was popular. And it one thing that he probably better than anybody, and I think you guys are certainly closer to, to Steve, and, they, and I think Steve and Scott have a lot of the similar type perspective on things. Is that um, he was always about release. There's you got to get a release, and and this is again this is before the Kelly Starrett stuff, you know, with the you know supple leopard and everything. I mean, Scott was doing the, the mobility flow stuff way back. And when when I when you hear about when you hear release, you think it's purely a physical aspect. You think it's purely just you know you know making something release. Well, if you guys have ever had a chiropractic adjustment like I have, and you, you understand that when – what's the first thing that, you know, if you're dealing with a good chiropractor is that they'll tell you relax, breathe, relax, breathe. And it's not anything that they learned, you know, in the last six months. It's something that they've been applying for a long period of time, and we just didn't know exactly how important the breathing and the relaxation is. When you are exceptionally tight in a certain area, say take the thoracic spine or the hips, I think for most people those are, those are areas they can identify with because most people, that's, that's the first place that I look, especially dealing with athletes. And, and people in general, when you're tight in those areas, it is physically or excuse, excuse me, psychologically intimidating. And what I mean by that, it, it's you're just you're tight and you go, I'm tight and I don't like it and I want it to change. <laughs> so what you do is you're the first thing you're thinking of is tension. You're thinking of stress, anxiety. I've got to find some way you start gritting your teeth. I see it all the time with people when they come to me and they go, well, I'm tight in my hip and they, or you know, my hip flexors, this, my, my, my the thoracic spine, my shoulders and everything else. Well, the first thing you got to do is to learn to get out of the, you know, anxiety part of making something change. You've got to allow it to change, just like when you're getting that chiropractic adjustment. And, you know, if you're resisting the chiropractic adjustment, say your SI joint or, you know, what have you, and you don't have to be an advocate of chiropractors to understand where I'm coming from on this. If you're fighting it where you're thinking, I've got to prevent something that's already bad from getting worse, then you're not going to get the release in that part of your body that you're intending to do with the drills that you're doing. When you're doing mobility drills, if you have got tension, whether it's psychological stress because of work, 
you know, home life, what no matter what it is, and you're trying to get an area, you'll notice that not only are you more likely to not get the change that you want, you're going to create more tension in that area that you're trying to release. Now, the reason that I bring that up is that set all that crap aside before you do any mobility stuff. I do my stuff first thing, my the primary mobility work first thing in the morning for two reasons. Number one, because that's my time alone. That's the, that's the first part of the day that I can totally get away from everything else except my dog who's up and I have to make sure he gets taken care of at that time in the morning. But the point is, is that by doing that, you you eliminate the psychological stress that typically impairs you being able to get a release in your hip flexors, your hip rotators, your thoracic spine. If you if you wait if you've got really tight areas and you wait until the middle of the day and you go in and you're stressed out already, you go, man, I've got an hour to work out total between here and driving back to the office, and I got to get my mobility in. And I see it over and over again with guys going, I feel tighter when I do the mobility stuff. When I'm doing all that stuff, I, I feel like, and so they quit it all together. And I go, it goes right back to they're fighting it. They're fighting the mobility stuff as opposed to, you know, they're gritting their teeth or, you know, it hurts, it's tight. Instead of allowing it, coaxing those areas to open up. And again, that's a, that's a lot of words to just come back to. You've got to look at it as a process. You're not going to change mobility in a day. But you do have to see it as a combination of getting certain muscles to activate, certain muscles to mobilize. And then once you free that up, then breathing, making sure that you breathe when you're doing that. And again, I can't show you on, we're only on audio here, can't show you exactly what we're talking about. But it goes right back to that. If you've had a chiropractic adjustment, you understand how important it is to be able to allow the adjustment without you trying to resist it. And yeah. that's, that's something very important, um, you know, when you're doing any of your mobility. You know, stuff. good good massages like that too, right? Sometimes the therapist Definitely. is working on you and you're all tense and you're contracting. Right. So you just kind of let. I mean, sometimes you do that involuntarily because it's painful. So that's your automatic response. But for her to really get in there, or him or her to really get in there, you have to relax. Yeah, and that's and that's something that you know I think most people that have been doing mobility for a while. It's probably they will identify with that better than somebody that's never done any mobility stuff. And, hey, I'm you know, just going to go try doing some stuff. Those that have been doing it for a while. And I work with again, I work with a lot of guys in their you know, 35 to 45 to 50 range. And, and that's and I know that from experience by talking with them. And when they do that, when they're tense and they're trying to you know, get some change in mobility, whether it's, you know, again, in the hips or the, the upper body someplace, that's typically, you know, what happens is they start storing all that tension and they have a bad relationship with the, with the <laughs> mobility work as opposed to, you know, letting it release. And when, when, when they're, when they're making a lot of old man noises, you know, it's bad. Someone, <laughs> yeah. someone, 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 <laughs> someone, someone is sitting down, like you go to the movie, someone gets up at the end of the movie. Ugh. <laughs> like, what are you, a Wookiee? What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> or like, like someone is trying to sit down without just collapsing in the chair. It's like, <laughs> that's kind of that kind of stuff is painful to watch. Like a lack of mobility is, is really painful to watch when you see it in people. Like well, I always talk about when I used to fly a lot, how people, so many people would have a hard time just getting in and out of the chair. We lose it. <laughs> you there? No, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. No, I thought I, I thought you. Were Come on, Vince. That was that was that was a, that was a handoff to you, man. No, I thought you were going to answer. No, and that and you're right and you're right about that. And the thing is, is that when you're when you're when you're tense, in which a lot of people when they fly are even more so. I mean, anytime that you add any type of psychological stress to it, right, to right. a to a position like you're seated for a long period of time, and it can happen. You know, somebody going to a sporting event. You know, and yeah, yeah, they're having a good time while they're there, but there's a level of tension. And when they've been in that seated position for an extended period of time, they get up and then you see they clutch their back. And I'm probably yeah. <laughs> probably one of them, you know, where you've been <laughs> seated for that length of time. It's definitely something that that affects you, you know, in a, in a lot of different ways. I mean, just because of the mental stress along with that. And I think and, and that's not a bad thing. Once you understand the relationship, you understand the psychological relationship with you storing tension in certain parts of your body, That's then you have some information to be able to do something about it. Like, for instance, if you've just had an argument with a with a coworker or somebody that's really just really gotten on you, I know you guys never argue with anybody, but if, if <laughs> say, somebody else, you know, and, and we, don't, very we, don't, we don't talk to anyone outside the show. So exactly. <laughs> 
I don't leave the house that often, so that kind of helps avoid. <laughs> but if you're, if you, that's not the time to do some neck rolls or some, you know, uh, or, or hip circles and things like that. I mean, it's because you're, because you're so locked up that you'll notice that that's actually not the time that you want to move in that type of way mm. when you probably need it the most. Yeah. And so, and so it's, it's, it's literally like, okay, you have to just set your side and it gets right back to that almost a meditative aspect of it where you just, you're able to just let your mind just say, look, okay, I've got a bunch of crap on my mind. I'm going to set it aside. There's nothing I can do about it while I'm doing this mobility work. Okay. It doesn't do you any good to think about, you know, the guy that just ripped you off or whatever while you're doing this stuff. I mean, you set it there and then go through the mobility stuff because otherwise you'll make it worse than better. And I know that that'll probably speak to somebody out there that's, you know, probably been going through some of that where they feel like, you know, you know, they're working out at the end of the day and they try to do some mobility stuff and they go, why do I feel worse going into my workout when I'm, you know, trying to do this mobility stuff that everybody keeps talking about? And it goes right back to try doing it in the morning, you know, try doing it first thing in the morning, you know, when you get up and you have that time, you know, whether it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes or, you know, yeah. uh, you, you want, you want to avoid training wherever possible after a long conversations, right? Positive yeah. or negative, but especially yes. negative. So let's say you have this hard negotiation business call and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go to the gym now. I yeah. guarantee you that's going to be a crappy workout. Yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. This is, and I know from experience, that's not the time that, that I ever have my best workouts and you know, Oh no, you're going and blowing off some steam. You know, that's yeah, great. You're, you're going to feel even worse yeah. because you can have a yeah. crappy workout. You're going to be like, man, yeah. that, that call was yeah. a pain in the ass. Then I just had a shitty workout. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. So that was compounded. You know, and another thing that that I'm sure anybody, any any business people that are listening, you know, people that that have you know a significant amount of demands on their time, you know, outside of the gym, do what I do. When I'm in the middle of a workout and I have a thought of, oh, I needed to call so and so, or I needed to do, or I needed to either have you know a voice recorder or your phone that you can speak into, or have a, have a pad that you can write down yeah. whatever it is to remember that, and and take the time. As much as it's, oh, well, I don't want to, no, it's, you don't want to try to remember, oh, I need to do this or, oh, I need to go. And, you know, when I get done here, I need to get rid of it, go yeah. write it down and, and put it in the, in the folder. I mean, don't, don't try to do, and that's less, thing less that, energy wasted, right? It's one less thing absolutely. to think about. Yeah. Write it down and you're done with it, you yeah. know, because then then, yeah. then in your brain, so you're already kind of like, okay, I've done it. I've dealt with it. I've dealt with it because it's there. I'm not having to, you know, try to remember, oh, I, I meant to call, you know, you're stepping into a heavy set of devil, something that requires <laughs> as much <laughs> tension that you're, that you're, that you're applying through your entire body when you do a deadlift. Yeah, that's and definitely not might, the time to think about it. That's for sure. You do not want, if a thought crosses your mind of, Oh, I needed to no that step back. Step away from the bar. About what you're, you're thinking about what you're going to do afterwards. Like, okay, once I finish this set, I'm going to go do this. It's like, yeah, that, that's being, that, that's a lot of wishful thinking there. Do the set first, then you can go do that other stuff. Yeah. You know, or if you're working out in a commercial gym and you have your two stations set up and you go for your heavy deadlift and then you go, crap, somebody's on the peg. <laughs> I mean, so no, well, but I'm just, but seriously, if you if you do, you, you have to you have to allow. That that that's that back to that sit loose in the saddle, and I think and it's more important. The reason I bring it is more important as we get older that those are the kind of ways that we take command of our workout instead of oh crap they showed up again and I know they're going to hog the you know this or I don't like that person because they just can't. Yeah, you know, I mean there's all kinds of things that can distract us. Well, we don't have the time or the luxury of being distracted. You know, once you get to a certain level, just from a standpoint of the injury risk, I mean, yeah. you just you can you can't afford it. I remember years ago reading where Tom Platts or I even heard Tom Platts talk about, it, and everybody should know who Tom Platts is, oh, yeah. you know, the mm -hmm. king of you know what do you want to call me, king of quads and yeah, he's, king yeah, of quads, quads. yeah, and Quadzilla. Uh, no, Quadzilla, I think was um, uh, who was it? Uh, there's another one that actually got that's there. a power lifter, I think. But, uh, but yeah, Tom but, Platts. But, but back, Tom Platts said, you know, he literally said an airplane could crash into one side of the gym and he wouldn't know it because he was so locked in. Now, <laughs> now, now I don't think, here's, I don't think he was here's ever the thing, tested. Tom. Yeah, here's the thing, Tom. I don't Tom. think he Did was ever tested happen? on that. <laughs> don't have proof. Because it's easy to say that shit. You know? yeah, I, don't I, don't don't I don't care if a fucking bomb goes off. It's like, yeah, well, we'll see what happens. You will. <laughs> I'm doing deadlifts and a bomb goes off. I'm out of the fucking building. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not going to try to get the set in first. You know? <laughs> No, but I got to make sure I get, I get my protein point, drink with me. I, I got to take my protein drink with me, though. Um, <laughs> but but the thing is, is that what's implying is how important it is to be absorbed mm -hmm. in that moment in that set. And it awesome. goes and it goes right back to 
one set. Do one set. You're as good as this set. Do one set. Not worrying about, okay, I've got on my plan today, I've got this much. I've got, I got, you know, four sets of this. I got two warm up sets and I got four. Yeah, you're going to know your plan. You're going to know your program, but don't get hung up on, okay, I'm on set two. Crap. I've got five. Like, for instance, the pull ups. Uh, that, if you're already so thinking worst. about set five, if yeah. you're already thinking of set five, yeah. you're. With, with, sprint, with to, sprinting, I find that especially, right? Like, I'll do 11 all out sprints twice a week. And after you do the first run, if you're thinking, man, I've got 10 more to do, you're, <laughs> yeah, you're defeated. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. Yeah. yeah. You have to, I, I always think of the only, the only think of the next run, right? So I just did two. Okay. Now you're going to do three. You just did the third one. Now you're going to do the fourth one. Fourth one. Now I'm going to do the fifth one. You, ha- you have to just think of it as one run at a time. And then all of a sudden you realize, wow, I did it. It's over. Well, you just, you just, um, it- Perfectly explain exactly what I tell all my guys when they have to run 25 110s, you know, or something like that, you know, for their, for their conditioning test is that don't get intimidated. In other words, you know, avoid the intimidation of being overwhelmed by how many. In other words, intimidation is going to suck more out of you than doing another 10, 10 110s. You know, when you think ahead, and I don't think you guys know the story, you know, like when um, candidates, um, Navy SEAL candidates are in their um, in their BUD training and they're, um, you know, said they've had their, I forget what it is now that they have to run in their full gear, you know, whether it's 12 miles, 20 miles, whatever it is. Yeah. And then and then they're told you got two and they crush. I mean, they, they crumble and they're, and not, they're the ones that quit. And, and that's where they have more guys quit at that stage where they hear the, no, I've set my level here. I can't do anymore. I've set it here. That shows you how powerful the mind is when you are thinking ahead, when you're thinking, I mean, you, you know, in other words, you didn't just run the, the, the another two miles that crushed you. It was the anticipation of those that crushed you. Oh, yeah. And it's this, and it's same thing when you're training, when you're training and you're not training for conditioning, but you're, you're training and you got five sets of five, you got, you know, eight sets of three, whatever you're doing that day, take that one. If you get ahead, quality is going to go down. Now, you may not figure that out the first time that you try to apply. It may take a while for you to develop that type of maturity where you can take it literally one set. It's like on your sprints where you can take one sprint, one sprint, one sprint. But that's what you practice. You practice getting better and better and better at taking it just one at a time, one at a time. And it goes back to you know, the argument um, about high reps, low reps, and all this kind of stuff. When somebody's doing high reps and they go, well, I'm going to do high reps because I hear it's better for hypertrophy or the effect of high reps, you know, it's a good variation to the low reps I've been doing, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, okay, that's great. Now, when you look at high reps as just something to get done, okay, well, I'm going to do 20 instead of five, or I'm going to do 20 instead of 10, and you're just Getting through the 20 reps any which way you can, it goes back to the, you know, what we were talking about earlier about, you know, efficiency and technical proficiency. When you change the way that you're doing the exercise, hoping that something good is going to happen because you got to some nebulous number of 20 or 25, then you've defeated the benefit of the high reps. The best way to get benefit, hypertrophy benefit out of high reps is to approach them the same way you would if they were low reps. And what I mean by that, if you're doing a set of, you know, say take an exercise, a, a single joint exercise. I know you guys don't do a lot of that kind of stuff, but say a tricep push down. And somebody's doing, you sure. know, they're on a program specifically for hypertrophy. And push downs obviously addressing the triceps. And they go, okay, well, you know, today I'm really going to emphasize blood flow. I'm going to get a set of 25. And, and I do that at times with my athletes, and we'll be on a hypertrophy program. And I'll watch them over there literally trying to, any way they can, get to 25 before they've gotten a two. You know, where they are just flying through the set. And I go, you defeated the whole point of the high reps. I mean, you right there, you just, you've used momentum to just get, you know, from, you just you used a very lightweight that did nothing. So basically what we have to do at that stage is maybe add some partial reps in at the beginning of the set where they understand what it means to contract the muscle. And then you see how doing those high reps where you have to introduce rest pause, where you have to, okay, you got to 12 and you failed and then you take a 10 second break and then you go again until failure and then you finally get up to 25 you know just like the you know the breathing squat thing you know it goes back to the same type of principle about using rest pause you know that's when you've had a quality set but if you're flying through doing you know 
dumbbell curls or even bench press and knocking out sets of 20 to 25 and you're bouncing the bar off your chest and you're going, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing high reps today. But, <laughs> right. not, but the quality is non-existent. Then you might as well, you're wasting your time. I mean, you just, you literally are only just satisfying the psychological aspect of having done high reps. You're not doing anything physically to change anything that's going to help you with your goal. So what you do is you find a way to make those higher reps as challenging as the low reps. So you take it one, 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 and watch how consistent you can keep your rep speed for the entire set as opposed to just flying through the set. And again, just thinking, okay, I got to get to some number that I've chosen because, you know, the muscles don't care. They don't care that you hit 20, 25, 5, 10, 100. They're only going to go by cause and effect. Were they affected? If they weren't, they couldn't give a rat's ass about what number you're on. And that's the same, or the, how much weight you're lifting. So it goes right back to the same thing, that quality and efficiency. And then another thing about training with efficiency is it's something you can count on to be able to see your progress. Because if you're changing it all the time, you never know if you're making progress or not because you're not duplicating it. And it goes in, and that's a, another thing about like when, um, you know, we talked about Tim Larkin before when he's teaching, um, you know, TFT and about, you know, techniques slowing them down so that, you know, you can, you know, understand the technique better. You see, he's teaching in that duplicate, um, things we can duplicate. Right. We want a technique that we can duplicate over and over and over and over again, as opposed to something that looks completely different every time. And then, you know, with TFT, if you look different every time you apply a certain technique, you know, to a body part, to break a certain body part, it, it's not going to be something you can rely on in a stressful situation. And it goes right. right back to training. We want your reps, we want our reps to be as consistent. They're not going to always be identical. I mean, there's, there's yeah, always – You want to be in the pocket. Because yeah, every, every time, time you're out of the pocket, it starts deteriorating. And you can always feel that when you're doing something. Maybe you're lifting something too soon, something too heavy too soon, or you're doing too many reps too soon where – all of a sudden, reps one through seven look great. Now eight, you're slightly out of the pocket. Nine, you're even more out of the pocket. Ten, it doesn't even look like the first seven reps. And yeah. then you just keep going. It just rapidly deteriorates. And then you never know if you're really making progress either. I mean, that's the thing is that you ultimately do want to finish that workout. Yeah, you don't, you don't want to count bad reps as actual reps. Mm -hmm. I think Charles Poliquin said that. So if you do eight reps and they're good and the rep nine looks like crap, then you shouldn't even count that. Exactly. Well, well, and that's where we, that's where we go back to the – well, that's just because of the score, you get the no count. And, and I'll do that with, right, with my athletes right. in a minute. Like, they hit a bad rep, like, no count. And they just, like, they correct things automatically because they hate to hear me say that. <laughs> it's like a stand, like, no count. And they're like, damn, I was right on nine. Like, no, you were on eight. Yeah. <laughs> nine sucked, so nine didn't even exist. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's another thing, you know, and I know we're going to jump around a little bit, but um, hypertrophy training, I think the most underutilized technique, is rest pause and what i mean yeah. by that is yeah. use a weight if you're doing high reps if you're going to do and, and again I'm, I'm an advocate of changing things up from that standpoint for hypertrophy so if you're doing a set of 20 use a weight that you're going to hit at least half without having to stop and what i mean by that assuming you're using an exercise that is not you know is not detrimental to your health by by hitting that limit that kinesthetic limit like i use in the article as opposed to as opposed to failure uh, a kinesthetic limit is that point where you'd have to change something to get another rep out so what you do is you say get a get a weight that you can hit that 10 to 12 you know that sweet spot of just over halfway and then you rest pause 10 seconds at a time until you get to 20 I find that that, from a muscle building standpoint, is far superior, and it helps your joints too because you're doing high reps, but you're not doing high reps again like we talked about or mentioned in a few minutes ago where you're just getting the reps in, you know, thinking that something magical is going to happen because you did 20 reps. You need to do 20 reps that are really starting to tap into to every type of muscle fiber that you have to the greatest degree. So by doing that, you, you get that, that weight that's right in that 10 to 12 spot, but then you carry it in. 220. And then however many sets it takes you, you you make a note of that. And then the next time through, you try to make it where you're hitting maybe 10, five yeah. and five, you hit 10, seven and three. I mean, there are ways to make progress with high reps that are beyond the, hey, I did 25. Because I find that when people are just basing it on how many reps they can do consecutively, it's really dependent on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, there's sometimes I've tried the real high rep stuff um, 
that um, that Doug um, Brisboy, you guys know him, bodybuilder from you know a while back, does a lot of stuff with Iron Man yeah. magazine and so forth. I know you guys love that magazine so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, hey, I've written for that. Like, I, except <laughs> you, you like you, you read it for the pictures I hear. Um, but um, but the, I read um, it to see if my article's in there. That's the only time I ever look at Iron Man. <laughs> good point. The um, but the thing is, is that, you know, he has this program that even he admits he doesn't stay on, you know, all the time. You know, where you right. do 50 reps, add weight, 40, 30, 20, 10, then you do a drop set on your last couple of sets. And I, I experimented with that just because I wanted, you know, like I do with a lot of different methods, just to see how my body would respond to it. And, you know, you use real light, say if you're using a dumbbell bench press or a decline dumbbell bench press, something like that. And you go, OK, I've got 50 pound dumbbells. I knock out 50 reps. OK, great. You know, now. I come back a week later and I start with those fifties and I'm at 35 and I'm like, shit, I'm not getting another rep today. Now, have I gotten weaker in a week? You see, you see, the point is, is that high reps, when you are basing it purely on consecutive reps, I'm not talking about rest pause. Now I can rest pause to 50 after I'd gotten to 35, but I'm talking about just knocking out boom, boom, boom. So much of it has to do with the integrity of, of you know, your, your glycogen levels on that day, your rest. I mean, there's so many things that go into whether you're good at high reps or you're not. Oh yeah. And I think, and I think that that's why it's very misleading to just stay on high reps all the time, because then you're like, okay, am I really, am I just going to the same place? And, and I can think of as much as we're talking about taking your, your, your training, you know, in, in, a, in a process and all that. I don't think there's anybody listening, including myself, that looks at training as maintaining. I mean, like, hey, you know, if all I'm doing, I'm going to go. Bust well, you, 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 certainly, you certainly you certainly don't want to. And we've brought that up before. Maintenance is an illusion. You know, you're either getting better or worse. So anyone that's anyone that says I'm just training to maintain <laughs> is probably in a deteriorating mode. But that but the thing is, is that the mindset. See, this is the key. The mindset, the result may be maintaining, but your mindset has to be, I'm sustaining this so that my next. Well, that's right. You actually, you actually have to focus on right. progressing just to maintain. Right. 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 You're exactly if you're focused on maintaining. It's going to be a regression. So if you focus on progressing, worst case scenario, you're maintaining. Right. So maintaining is a form of progress, especially especially as we get older. Oh, yeah. No we doubt. have to we have to approach it that way as opposed to, OK, if I'm not going up in something, then all I'm doing is going backwards. And I think that happens to a lot of guys at certain stages where they just cannot unless they have some. Competitive- it, it can be some other barometer too, right? Like the quality that the rep, the quality of the right. reps is better. You're, right. you're able that, to get the workout done in yeah. less time. Their technique was better. So you focus on different parameters as well. And that goes, and exactly, and that goes into the kinesthetic efficiency that's in the article that I mentioned. I know that's, you know, again, kind of a, kind of one of those, hey, that's a fancy word for something very basic. It's your, it's your sixth sense. <laughs> right. It's just basically something that, that, you know, it's a word that I created because I identify with it in the, in the fact that, you know, you can always enhance what's happening with a certain weight, even if it's the same weight, same reps. And it goes right back to stick with the basics as opposed to trying to get too fancy. If I do a dumbbell bench press to this day, I feel it more in my chest and my pecs, and I can make whatever weight that I'm using work better for me. So it's not – I don't need to all of a sudden go, hey, my body's gotten used to dumbbell bench press. You know, So right. now I've got to go to – you know, like, for instance, in my gym, my dumbbells go up to 120. Now, does that mean that, crap, if I've gone up to 120 – then I'll never make any progress because I, that's, that's absolute garbage. I mean, there, there are ways that you can make that 120 or 100 even even better than yeah. if you jumped up to 130 or 135 or so forth, things like that. So for anybody, otherwise, everybody would be using 800 pound dumbbells at some stage. I mean, you just <laughs> you get so strong that you know eventually, and that goes back to the other thing. Um, you know, I was thinking the other day when I was you know writing down some notes. Say if you worked out in a gym for three months. You know, that was away from your typical gym and you grab their dumbbells and you went, man, I am really these are these are 120s. And man, I mean, I'm really feeling it. Maybe it's the handle. Maybe it's something that's different about it. Maybe it's the gym environment. Maybe it's just the change of scenery. But man, I'm absolutely brutalizing my workout now, man. And my body's growing. I'm, I'm feeling better. I mean, I see the changes and, you know, muscle hypertrophy, all the things are going good. And then you get back home or get back to your home gym and you go and you pick up the 100s. And you go, shit, what's happened here? And then you find out that the dumbbells you were using were 95s at the, at the gym, <laughs> but they just had 120s. Do you see? And, and, and the thing is, is that, and I know somebody, oh, that's, 
seriously. I mean, if you look back at, would you lose your gains? Would you? Would you? Would you lose your gains if you did get the benefit out of the ninety fives the right. way that you thought they right. looked in one twenties? Now, is weight important? Yes, the amount of weight is important. It's important as part of the process, not the process. When it comes down to building muscle, it's important right. when you're when you're targeting like you are with a deadlift, a PR. There's certain key exercises that I think that we should like. I do with the deadlift, just like you do with the deadlift. I do with the deadlift. And and I and I use that as that one exercise, say that I that I look to to and I and I never go to failure on it. You know, you'll never see me go, okay, you know, like okay, yeah, go for a, a better one RM, but it's not I'm not looking at it as I'm taking the set of deadlifts to failure. I look at it as okay, I'm adding five more pounds or I'm adding two and a half more pounds and I've got some of the small plates. I'm adding, you know, do the micro loading, you know, kind of like, you know, you're talking about Poliquin that always did. Yeah. You know, some way of just kind of ramping up gradually. Now, I don't do that with every exercise. It's not it's not like I go and I look at the dumbbells and I go, okay, this is what I did last time. I mean, two things. Number one, psychologically, you'd be an absolute mess. But then also, you can't make progress like that on every single exercise. You can't. I mean, and I hate to use the word can't. It's not practical. Now, if you had nothing to do in your life other than train, rest, sleep, eat, do you know all the you know, regeneration things, and you literally, that's all you did. <laughs> Then, then I understand maybe being a little bit more in control of every aspect of your training where you could identify with the numbers. But right. when that's not reality, pick one, maybe two exercises. That are the go-to exercises that you're going to be able to make a proper assessment on your progress with. And then use the other fill-in exercises to, to enhance you know, a total program. You wouldn't want to just live off nothing but deadlifts. You want to make sure that you're training other parts of your body and all that. Right. And I do the same thing with pull-ups. I mean, I'll ramp it up where I'll, you know, get up to using, you know, external load that's, you know, a certain target that I have. And then I'll start to fill up my elbows. I'll start, something will happen when I get to a certain point, then I'll back back off and then I'll revisit, um, you know, different angles of pull, maybe just do ring pull-ups with body weight for a while with the isometric hold at the top, you know, things like that. Yeah. And then my body will start, I'll start craving that added weight again. And it'll come back and I'll go, man, I now I'm really looking forward to hanging that extra weight on me again, right. and doing, doing those low reps and, and high weight. So it's that kind of process that we always need to, you know, keep in mind that it's, it's not about every exercise, you know, you know, everything that you do from a franchise standpoint, you know, going up in numbers, but it's taking those select. And then on the others, focus on just, you know, the quality of the movement, you know, what's happening with, you know, getting better at being able to dial in, you know, with your, your body type on like dumbbell press, you got long arms, short arms, finding different ways of being able to enhance the activation of those muscles, you know, and that's, yeah. that's not, that's not getting sissy. I mean, that's just, that's reality. And you're going to be healthier by looking at it that way. Yeah. Well, that's a good multi-dimensional approach rather than being overly fixated on one, on one parameter of progression. So, hey, man, great information, and I, I encourage everyone to check out the article you wrote that discusses a lot of these principles as well, and we'll get that in the show notes. Yep. But where can people find out more about what you have going on? Directly email me at mcconnellathletics at gmail.com is the best way. And also, March 1st, our new website will be up. And that'll be a lot easier for everybody to see our information and be able to contact me through that. And um, I try to answer every personal email just so everybody knows. Uh, um, you know, if you just give me an opportunity to get back to you and respond to you. But if anybody has any comments about what we talked about or, you know, even a quick question, you know, I'll be glad to respond to it. And our um, website will be McConnellAthletics.com. Okay, and that's what that's what you used to have. So it's just being yeah. restructured oh, yeah. now. Okay. Oh yeah, Re restructured and kind of modernized a little bit. Okay. And, uh, and go from there. And uh, very little ad copy. So you won't have to worry about me selling you nope. any um, muscle confusion, you know, muscle really? confusion or anything. <laughs> no, that's. I'll leave that to those other guys that are very good at it. <laughs> well, sounds good, Vince. Always All a right. pleasure, and look forward to talking to you again. Talking to you again soon. Awesome, right. Mike. I appreciate it. Sincere. All Thanks, right. guys. Take care, man. Take care, Vince. Bye. Okay, my privilege. All right, folks. I'm too I'm too tired now to to really pitch you hard on <laughs> going and buying some shit after a, a great two hour conversation with Vince. But yep. go use that coupon code LLA. Go get ten percent off the best nutrition supplements around. Get on Restorezyme. You want to improve your recovery. You want to make sure that you have better workouts each week. Get on Restorezyme. Get three bottles. Get ten percent off, and you get a discount for buying bundles. 
So check that out at MikeMahler.com. Yeah, same thing. NewWarriorTraining.com. Use the same coupon code, 10% off. Hey, man, it's cold outside. You need some coffee. So get a Cheerio <laughs> door, man. So put that Cheerio door to use. Order one now. Get the big one, the big Tejas. That's that's um, our native language for Texas. So that's the reason why the big one is named the Tejas. <laughs> All right, so get that one and get your coffee on, man, and get it with pour over, which is, like, even better than just getting in a drip machine. All right, so do that. And also head over to patreon.com slash LLA podcast, become a monthly supporter of the show. And hey, five dollars, ten dollars, all of that helps out. Last but not least, share the show, go out and head over to iTunes and go over to Stitcher, rate, review, share the episodes, let the people know this is what you love to hear each and every week. So for some of the best training advice and guests that Yeah, we have we have thousands topics. of thousands of listeners and hundred and ninety seven reviews. So let's iTunes. make it so so that's- let's fix that. How about every Explain single someone. person who's listening to this episode, go leave a review. How about that? Right there. Just say excellent. <laughs> yeah. That's why you can just drop one word. Excellent. Love it. They're the bomb. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You don't have to write yeah. a thesis. Yeah. Just say you like the show. <laughs> Quick and simple. It helps us out. Yep. And also share – if every single person listening shared this episode with one person, that doubles our audience. Yep. And it's not – don't tell me that's hard to do. That's a retweet. That's a post on Facebook. That's an email to a friend. You don't have any friends. <laughs> you know, Come on. Email the episode. Share the episode. Get it out there. Help us build this, this great medium. Yep, and thanks to everybody that's been – Continue to share on social media, especially our Twitter followers, man, who reach out all, all the time. So with the usual suspects and big shouts out to them. We're going to give a shout out list to those those constant tweeters as well. So there you go, folks. Until the next time. Take care, everybody. Take care.